the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perotti. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Whoa! All right, welcome everybody to the Safety Doc Podcast here on Pi Day. Vanessa let me know that. I was not aware, but it is 3.14. I'm not going to go through the rest of it, but yes, it is Pi Day. Um, Pretty amazing, right? Also, one month and one day to tax day. So something I need to get done. But welcome, everybody, to the Safety Doc Podcast. It is unusually cold today, and I don't kind of just say that for shock value because typically it is cold here in Wisconsin. But we were sold this forecast of 50 to 60 degrees all week, and it just hasn't panned out. (laughs) So right now it's about 30 degrees, and I needed to start a fire, and that's the way that I heat my house. So I needed to, you know, fire up the burner and get it to temperature, get enough wood up there, and make sure that everything was circulating to uh, make sure it doesn't get too cold here at night. But I thought I'd be okay, you know, looking at the forecast. It was all right today. It wasn't great. Um, But yeah, so a plus and a minus from today. But first of all, a shout out to Vanessa Kitty, Solitude Surfer, good friend Phil Henry from Germany. So right now, Andrew S. Wow. Um, Thank you so much for uh, being here. And yeah, so show got uh, started a little later because I needed to um, fire up the boilers here at the uh, old Safety Dock homestead and uh, get the house heated. It's crazy how cold it is right now. We'll see if it gets warmer in the next couple of days. Um, at some point, it has to. So um, I did. I bought two things today. I wanted to buy a garden hose. So my garden hose of twenty years is it's inside of a you know box right you just reel it in stuff like that in the and uh so i have one in the front one in the back and actually one on the side of the house so just as a hose it just sits on the ground on stones that hose is fine like never a problem the one in the back i opened up the hose reel and the hose is all consumed like chewed up so we have squirrels that you know the plastic edging that goes around your house or trees or something like that. They completely eat that. So I'm having that replaced um, next month with concrete edging. So good luck with that squirrels. But, uh, but yeah, the first time in 20 years that we've lived here, I opened it up and like most of the hose was gone. (laughs) And I know it didn't happen in the garage because there wasn't any remnants of hose left, like from this chewing. So I usually take those in about the middle of October after we've had our first freeze. And so squirrel must have got in there and just gone to town, which I don't know what the deal is. Like, what's the nutritional value in eating a hose? So, uh, but yeah, so it was a brand called Soft and Supple Hose by Swan. And uh, so I went to buy a replacement one today. And it's just not the same quality. It's (laughs) so... I'm like, I'm just disappointed. Like all of all the hose options, there wasn't a good hose option. So I just went with another one of these. And, you know, they have, I don't want to go with a hose that blends in with the lawn because if I leave it out there and I'm mowing or something else, they want like a little difference of color. So that kind of eliminates some of them. But I don't need anything heavy duty. It's just in the backyard for watering plants. And then I have to be able to get it down to where our um, flower garden is and stuff like that for sprinkler. But it's disappointing. I'm like this quality sucks. Um, so anyway, like as I'm as I'm like putting it in the hose reel, it's like kinking and stuff like that. Non-kink hose, right? Like I kinked eight times and I'm trying to figure this out, but I'm like, well, it is what it is. But I also had to replace a shop light. I had a ballast go bad in one of my shop lights. And you know, if you've got these flu- fluorescent tubes, they're really difficult to try to re- deal with, like when they burn out, like right. If you, you know, we have a recycling center that's out of town, so you can take it there. And I'm like, but yeah, you know, it's kind of a pain and then you have to pay. So I'll end up doing that. I have like three dead bulbs I have to take there. So I bought a fluorescent fixture 
um, for like 50 bucks. And this thing is really great. It has two settings, like a high, which is 10,000 lumens and a, and a low, which is 5,000, which is brighter than the, the baseline one I had in there. And uh, super easy to install. You can daisy chain these things. You can just plug them into each other. And I have it hardwired. So I have a switch in my ceiling in my furnace room. When I flip on the switch for the lights, that switch becomes active. So it's really nice. It lights everything up. I'll probably get a couple more. So that's a positive. And to think like 50 bucks for something like that, that'll probably last longer than a dock, right? So, but, um, so that's been pretty cool. But yeah, the hose is disappointing. I don't even, I don't know if there's a, you know, and I don't want to spend a lot on a garden hose either. Like that seems like a stupid investment because like it could just get eaten up again. But at the same time, I'm like this, I don't know. Like to go through all of the selection, this was a major farm supply store that I went to today. Um, and I'm like, there was nothing here that I impressed me, you know? So um, anyway, it's not that big of a deal. It's a hose and whatever, but I was kind of bummed out. Um, but then, yeah, the light made up for it. Critters enjoy munching plastics. This is from uh, Vanessa. My neighbor said... Um, that my that they have had squirrels chewing now. Oh, we have squirrels and muskrats and things like that. We butt up against uh, parkland, which is authentically like you know marsh and woods and stuff like that. But um, I I have never had this happen to our house. But right right next to us, thirty feet away, is our neighbor's house, and they said the concrete the squirrels are chewing the concrete on the house. I'm like well. <laughs> I don't know how you remedy that, but we haven't had that issue coming in. So, um, hey, this is our good friend John Steele saying, I saw the pics of your wood stash. You have enough firewood. To, you know, I did. I'm down to about a cord and a half right now from maybe, I don't know, 16, 17 cords to start the year. So I'm down to about a cord and a half. So that's how much firewood I burn. It's an insane amount. It actually, so in front of me is the fireplace room not the fire, but the furnace room, which then has the furnace. And then I also store, it's the reserve pantry and it is um, where I store the firewood. I store it all the way up to the, well, not to the rafters. I leave about a foot between the rafters and the wood. And then I just put an 18 inch, inch walk path on the left side and the right side. And that's it. So there's a lot of firewood down there. Like I said, 17 cords um, that I, that I will put down there between October and November of every year. And now I'm down to like just a quarter and a half, just kind of in a corner, everything else is cleaned out. So burn a lot of firewood. That's how I eat my house. Um, and that's, so it's good. And what I do is then I put all the ash, not all of it, but I put a lot of the ash in the back of my property in a big pile. So it looks like Mount St. Helens from uh, 1980, right? In Washington state. And then I take that and as the as it warms up in spring and when it gets dry, because you don't want to deal with the stuff that's mushy and wet. I take the ash and I spread it around my yard because it's very nutrient dense and I have sandy soil. So it's a win-win because I burn hardwoods and then I put it over our garden and stuff like that. So Vanessa's saying prairie dogs gnaw through concrete. I found that out in a survey of black footed ferrets in Colorado in April, uh, 1907. So first of all, my voice, my voice is good, but I am narrating my own book. I'm narrating um, the Vlast, not the Vlast, I'm narrating School of Errors, which released in 2019. And I um, I practice every night narrating, and then Wednesday mornings and Friday mornings, I go to the studio and with the sound engineer, and we record the book, right? So that should be done by May, because I, I don't record I record for about 80 minutes and my voice kind of gives out. But um, last night I did a lot of practice for an upcoming recording session. So that's where, it is. hey, it's Pokes of Bob. So um, I, let me let me do something here, Pokes of Bob. I'm going to give you a wrench because I know how well you manage um, the channel there for my good friend Terrence Pop. So just give me a second here. I have three monitors in front of me. So you're like, what is Doc looking at? A ghost? Possibly, I mean, it's not that 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 couldn't happen, but I, no, I'm not. I'm looking at the third monitor. 
at some point I want to, I have three 27 inch monitors, which span over six feet in front of me, but the main monitor in front of me, I want to replace and go with something a little bit bigger then push these side monitors out a little bit more. So I've got to think through this a little bit, but, uh, but yeah. Um, so that is awesome. And uh, yeah, it's excellent fertilizer ashes. I burn hardwood. So yeah, it is very nutrient dense. And then uh, every year I do that. So I appreciate, um, well, <laughs> so every year I do that, right? I just put a big pile of ash in the backyard. People are like, what did your house burn down? I'm like, nope, nope, I'm good. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's, it's too cold. I mean, it's the middle of March and this is usually the time when I'm tuning up my bike because I bike a hundred miles in an outing in summer. And I, I try to get in, you know, in April, I try to do like 40 to 60 mile rides. So I was watching the karate kid last night which is kind of unrelated to this, but um, it's kind of like my progression on riding. Like I, I just kind of have to work up to it before I can like, you know, do the uh, crane move and, and be able to do anything. I don't know if that made sense, but, um, but anyway, I'm, I'm uh, feeling a little bit behind here in my, in my bike prep because I order my tires from Japan for my bike. Um, so Anyway, things are going okay, but um, it's just it's too cold. So, hey, Bob. Hey, buddy. Appreciate you. I'll see you over at uh, Terrence Pop's uh, channel a lot. So, um, so let me go back and do a catch-up here and then and tell you what I am going to talk about today. And then also um, I have an interview Thursday with our um, area newspaper, and they're going to interview me at the – library where I'm donating two books. So I picked out the two books tonight, two hard copies that I'm donating. And then I will exercise them. You know, I will break them in. <laughs> so where you pull, you know, one hardcover down and the other, then you kind of take 20 pages in, 20 pages and fan it out. And then I will inscribe both of those uh, differently and use my signature stamp here uh, for my, my book and get those all ready for uh, Thursday morning. Which, uh, which is cool. I mean, it's, it's good public relations. It's good for the library. It's good for the community. It's good for me. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, so let's go back to the chat here. And best intro. I like my intro. I'm going to go in and do, do an update to it very soon. I have several um, kind of pictures of me that, you know, just kind of uh, still shots in front of the camera that, I usually don't take for this show, but I take it when I teach my university course, which I'm teaching right now. And I post it in somebody's chat from my my regular uh, YouTube channel, which has like 70 subscribers or something. But um, that's where I park my university lectures. And so like people subscribed into there and like, okay, like this is cool. Like you can, you can see my university lectures, but this is just... Uh, it's an academic site, right? I'm not I'm not doing podcasts from this site. So if you want to find a lecture that I did for superintendent legal issues, it's probably in there. So, um, but yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, so I've yeah, I have some big things coming up here. I am uh, so obviously we have the the release here of the velocity of information. So for those of you that aren't aware, this is my second book. Um, this is the truth book about uh, what um, the, the year 2020, right? It's the unpacking of um, were you essential, non-essential, inessential? What does this mean going forward? So it comes in hardback, comes in paperback, uh, ebook. I am also uh, releasing the audiobook that's professionally recorded. That will release in April of 2023, the audiobook. But uh, but yeah, so this book is is out there. So it's been selling now already even though they say april 1st is when it releases i can see that it's it's selling before that so i'm not sure but so i have uh, my first stack of hard copies here this, these look phenomenal by the way like this is such a vibrant color it goes over to the um to the spine i mean this is this is an awesome book 208 pages which i boiled and boiled and boiled down like making maple syrup right like in wisconsin here I boiled this thing down so when you get it, 
you're not going to have to go through a lot of verbose stories and building up. There's a lot of interviews. There's 10 interviews in this book for 108 pages, but I, I condensed things down. It really, it's a, it's going to be a brisk pace. You're going to enjoy reading it. So the philosophy of information, and I'm thrilled. Um, I'm thrilled to have it out there. Um, so yeah, anyway, <laughs> um, palindrome week for the days of uh, a few weeks back every day is a palindrome wow vanessa has deep thought for tonight and it's our good friend yes john Steele from seattle washington was a guest on the show you can find him if you go back at safety phd and do a search you'll find escaping seattle with john Steele. so john yes this book informed by uh, a good discussion that john and i had about extended periods of chaos so that his fingerprints are in the uh, works of uh, the velocity of information. Curs enjoy munching plastics. Yeah. Uh, I still have the original like blueprints I drew out when we moved here 20 years ago on the landscaping I was going to do, which I did do with relatives uh, to push out a six foot stone barrier with, you know, different decorative bushes and stuff. I mean, we have very kind of cool landscaping. But now um, I'm having that replaced, the, the plastic, the industrial kind of plastic that goes around to keep the stones in with concrete curbing. So I had a company come last fall and they quoted me and they said, we don't know if we'll be able to get it done in fall or not. They weren't able to get it done in fall. They called me about a week ago and they said, we will honor our quote for you to do this concrete curbing. But if you were to do it today, it would be 60% more with inflation. So they'll honor the original quote. So I'm like, yeah, when you guys can get in. I also have like a big concrete pad on the side of my garage, which I'm replacing. It's cracked very bad. That was like an add-on to the house before we got here. And then I'm going to have it pushed out further so I could park a vehicle over there if I ever need it to. Um but yeah, so anyway, if that makes any sense. So critters enjoy munching plastics. Absolutely. All pro Leventon. Welcome. But you know, that bike image just makes me think it is not long. Within a month, I will be out biking. And I love biking. I, the only thing I have to change this year is like, you know, beef jerky. I, I would consume beef jerky every time I biked. It's just, it's too expensive. Not that I can't afford it, I guess, but I just don't. I don't want to give the satisfaction to the beef jerky companies. <laughs> it's funny because I have a friend who who lives in an area where there's a major beef jerky company. And he's like, come up here and I'll set you up with like a huge, you know, sack of like, you know, extras from their stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'll take you up on that. But um, so I don't know. I have to come up with a different way to get protein while I'm biking. So it might be tuna packets, you know, which I've done before and stuff like that. But um, I'm just not going to spend like $10 on beef jerky when I'm out biking. I don't know. There's just psychologically, it just doesn't, it doesn't square with me. So, um, Vanessa said, Hey, we had worked through 30 plus cords per year growing up. Yeah. That's a lot of cords. <laughs> that's, yeah. And so what I do too, is like, I haul all of the firewood from my garage into my basement. So at a sack at a time, and then I stack it and then I work. On it. So folks, Bob, yes. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate, appreciate you. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. so. This channel had this amazing subscription, like, you know, just like straight up to like 1700 and then it just stayed there. <laughs> so I don't know what's up. <clears throat> yeah, I feel fine. My voice, it's just because I've been narrating a lot. And when I narrate, I record, I video record my narration and I watch myself then after that. And what I've been narrating now for like upcoming chapters, I really feel comfortable with. There's a lot of work to go into developing a manuscript for narration. People don't think about that, but you have to make sure you know like how to pronounce somebody's last name and things that you're going to eliminate, right? You're going to not say abbreviations and stuff like that. And um, how your pace is going to, and, and you have to think about the tone you're going to take when you narrate. So I think of myself believe it or not, as Macaulay Calkin, <laughs> or, you know, as what, what did he play? What was, was Kevin, right? And um, Home Alone. I kind of try to take that prosody 
in how I present. Um, or a little bit of Tucker Carlson, but not with the gotcha type. It's more probably like a, of a Kevin from Home Alone. So I practice that. And I think I've got it pretty good. So it's consistent throughout the book. And so I'm, I'm, I aim for April or not April, August 1st launch of that book, but it'll likely come out before then. And a PDF document, you know, that will be a companion, but I think I'll have it out by July 1st. So that's exciting. I'll be in find away voices and libraries, stuff like in my own voice, right? School of errors. Again, philosophy of information is being professionally narrated. I picked the narrator for that. Um, I might've shared in a previous show, but that was a cool process. You know, many people gave uh, inter uh, narration trials. So you get to listen to 10 minutes of them narrating your book. You get to pick out people. And so I'm excited for a very prominent actor to be narrating my book. And especially with 10 interviews, like I couldn't pull it off. I can do School of Errors because I wrote it and it's really first person and I don't go into like these multiple interviews. Um, so that's going to be fun for people to listen to. Um, where School of Errors, I needed to bring in the talent and that is awesome. I can't share who that person is yet until we're completely done. It's a contract stipulation. <laughs> so yes, but... Uh, I'm excited. Pokes Bob, what do you do with all the ash? I spread it on my yard and my gardens. So completely keep all of it. But in winter, I store it in the back. So at the end of my property, I just like mound it up. <laughs> so it looks like this little volcano at the end of my property, which is like 100 feet back from my house. So, you know, but the neighborhood kids then, there's a sledding hill in back of that that the neighborhood kids all go to. So I have to make sure like the, the ash pile isn't anywhere where kids would be kind of like trying to work their way through to the sledding hill. Um, so actually, like I made a little trail this year for the kids to make it easier. Like I cleared out, there's there's brush at the end of our property. And then if you go through that, you get to the sledding hill. So I, I spent some time with saw, you know my saws and, and made a definite path, which everybody used. So I feel good about it. Like it goes right through the end of our yard again 100 feet back and like last week there were a lot of kids out there we had a snow day like six inches of snow uh for it is yeah so i spread it spread it around do it with a just a rake in my yard then eggshells yeah good stuff there's a lot of stuff you can use that people just throw out right for fertilizer i live on a hill very sandy soil not very it's just sand <laughs> i mean if you just dig down it's just sand that's all it is um so it's great because I never had water in my basement because of a rainstorm. One one year, I think we had like eight inches of rain in a day here. And, uh, and because I'm on a hill and it's sandy soil, I you know, never had water in the basement. But um, but yeah, Vanessa is saying, I've been quoting you, uh, your School of Errors lately. So thank you, Vanessa. School of Errors, let me bring this out here, is the most honest book ever written about the $3 billion school safety industry. Here it is. Um. Yeah, this is an awesome book. And as I narrate it, I kind of forget about some of the, the things that I talked about in this book, like the rescue of 500,000 people in nine hours from lower Manhattan. How did that happen? Um, so it's all in this book. This is my first book. It's exceptional. And yeah, I mean, if you're a parent, if you're a taxpayer, if you're someone just interested in how like, you know, public institutions such as schools make safety decisions, get this. The chapter on social contract about Hobbes Leviathan is also extremely valuable. So there's so much in this book. Um, and thank you, Vanessa, for writing a review and posting it to Amazon. I greatly appreciate that. I saw as of today, we have 48 reviews on Amazon, and that is awesome. I am uh, I'm optimistic that we'll get 50 reviews by April 1st, which is the date that the Velocity of Information releases. So we're just two away. But yeah. This is a cool book and I, I love reading it because um, I'm, you know, I'm passionate about school and community safety. And this is just a very well-written, insightful book. So I have fun narrating it. So here it is, School of Errors. And it's funny because I went on Amazon, it says something like this, to start the week, it said, only 12 copies remaining, order now. And then like by the end of the week, only 18 copies remaining, order now. I'm like, I don't know where all these copies are coming from, but. Anyway, it's a it's a terrific book, so that's yeah, a cool thing. Um, 
folks bob yeah thanks buddy finesse hi everyone i'm behind your uh replacing my bike cables the stainless steel cables this year good job on the recumbent yeah i'd like i'll probably get to a recumbent bike once i get a little bit older so i have my my work meal bike right now which is a rebuilt trek 7.4 <laughs> i mean it's only there's very little that's original on the bike i've had it rebuilt several times i I had rims built for it, which are hand pulled rims. Um, you know, so it is, it is meant for travel. It's not meant for speed, but I want it that way. It's a tour bike. And when I'm out, um, it needs to do what it needs to do for a hundred miles, meaning it needs to uh, be able to carry cargo, which is, you know, be reliable um, and sturdy. So yeah, all of that comes to play, but I, I love my bike. I absolutely do. And can't wait to get out biking again. I have nothing big. I have to put new tires on. I have nothing big that I have to replace this year. You know, all my cables, chain, everything else is good. My rims are good. Um, but yeah, so when I bike and which will be soon, I start up, I'll do 40 miles then 60 and then 80, then I'll just do a hundred. 100 mile ride starts early in the morning. I eat, eat oatmeal. I will do like a <laughs> massive amount of oatmeal and, uh, you know, infuse it with, um, you know, uh, dried cranberries and stuff like that. And, but oatmeal um, is absolutely terrific to eat before you bike. And then I do black coffee also, just as a jolt. But, you know, oatmeal is phenomenal if you're biking just kind of levels your glucose levels as you're biking and you don't get like where you feel tired in the first hour or two. You know, once I'm out biking, cause you know, like a uh, hundred miles will take me, I don't know, maybe nine, 10 hours, but that's what stops, you know? So, um, so I don't get physically tired. <clears throat> I don't get physically tired once I bike, um, after two hours, I'm fine. Is the first two hours you kind of get physically tired. You have to mentally kind of work through. Like, why am I out here? I hate this. What am I doing? This is crazy. Um, once you get beyond that, like, uh, it's it's all good. So, and then I have like a, an MP3 player, which is an old Samsung S5. And I load up uh, podcasts. I listen to podcasts. I have this uh, indoor-outdoor speaker that I bought a couple of years ago. And I put it in the back of my bikes. So on a windy day, it doesn't work. But on a, like, non windy day it works fine i can listen to a podcast for like three four hours before that battery kind of gives out um so that's what i'll do on my way back um so but anyway like i love biking you know i love biking it sucks because i'm in wisconsin so between november and april you can't bike i mean you can if you're crazy right but I mean, if you have a tour bike like I do, you just can't. There's too, right. There's no ice in the roads, and I'm not going to bike when it's cold. I don't like that. <laughs> so, you know, if it's if it's 90 degrees, like yeah, that's a hundred mile day for me. So, um, man, I'm against expenses. I've been meaning to ask, what is that blue circle on the wall? That blue circle is a record that was. Uh, it's just a a record, an old 33 RPM record that my daughter painted blue when she was in art class and gave it to me. <laughs> so I put it up on the wall. It's a, it's a record. Um, so, yeah. Hey, it's uh, Shinobi Juan. Yo, yo, yo. Plus you. Thanks, buddy. Hey, Juan. Brother Pokes Bob. And uh, Phil Henry, this show's better quality than most university lectures, society ideas. Thank you, Phil. Um, I appreciate that. And actually, I, I appreciate that, definitely. And coming back to this book is out there now. Now I know it's $75 in hard copy, which is ridiculous, right? Like unless you're <laughs> really trying to impress somebody, you're not going to buy hard copy. It's 30 that they put it at 75 because this book will sell in very well to libraries, right? This is school of errors is in hundreds of libraries across the world. Velocity of information will be in hundreds of libraries. So the publisher does that and universities and so forth. Um, but for $35, you can get this in paperback, which is also a great value, $33 for ebook. Next year, it'll come out in audio book. I don't know what the price of that will be. This is a phenomenal book, though. And I had custom graphics made for this book. There's nothing like this out there. 
Um, and actually, you know, th this is right on right on the cusp of do you ban this book or not because of questioning essential versus non-essential. I mean, this is as edgy as you'll get in your Amazon cart. So um, you will not be disappointed in buying this book. Absolutely won't. I spent 3,000 hours, that's no lie, putting this book together. 471 endnotes, but they're all Chicago style at the end. So you're not like interrupted as you're reading it. I interview people who don't give interviews. Linda Stone, former Microsoft vice president, doesn't give interviews, gave an interview to me. So you're going to find stuff in here that you've found nowhere else. And especially right now, as we potentially enter an additional chaos event, whether that be war or inflation or whatever, this book is the um, set of, of, of special op glasses. As you look through, you're like, oh my goodness, I, I see things now. So you'll like it and you'll love the stories. You'll love the interviews in this book. Um, anyway, I'm thrilled about it and you can order it right now on Amazon. It releases April 1st. I think they're shipping them early. So um, I've, I've seen the numbers and things, but anyway, like get it now. So yes, this is our good friend, Phil Henry. Ray said this. Thanks, Phil. And, uh, so I have some big new, some big news also at the university that I teach for. I've taught for for 18 years, um, and I can't. Well, I have big news, right? That I can't release. I can't give that out yet. But I might have uh, some sub substantial positive news coming out from the university that I teach for. It's a private university along the Wisconsin River, and it's amazing actually to uh, teach there. It's a building that still has the uh, chalk boards from a hundred years ago. So when you teach there, you are assigned special chalk as an instructor. So when you you, you go up in front and on these slate boards that are hundred or 120 years old, you're using this very special chalk on these slate boards. It's pretty incredible. Um, but anyway, hey, I saw Joe Dolio gave your new book. He did. I appreciate that. Yeah, Joe. And Joe Dolio, if you do a, hey, Bacon, by the way, um, if you do a word cloud for the book, which Google did, Joe Dolio shows up as a larger image on the, the word cloud. He's represented literally like 20% of the book with, yeah, and that's proper because uh, Joe is a, a brilliant, perceptive person. So you know, Joe Dolio, um, like, you know, how to identify indicators of Joe Dolio, Joe Dolio is an early chapter. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. And likewise, going back to Joe Dolio's uh, Tactical Wisdom series, which he started a year ago, that book series has done extremely well, continues to um, amplify as he releases new books. So the Tactical series um, from Joe Dolio is, uh, is is doing very well, rightfully so. And so, yeah, that's the part. Like, you read this book and you're like, hey, like I get to know Joe Dolio. I get to know Clay Martin. I get to know Larry Lawton, Linda Stone, Morgan Rogue, Juan Brown from reading this book. There's nothing out there like it. 471 endnotes. I mean, it, so when you read this and you go forward, you know, someone could, if they challenge it, right, can say it's, it's fully cited, right? Doc has this stuff down. This is just such an awesome book. It starts out with these essential versus non-essential. Carl the Barber in Osawa, um, Michigan. And something weird is like I've talked to people, and as you know, we start to talk about the book because I have an interview coming up Thursday. You know, with ma uh, major local kind of media and then other media sources, and and people do not remember that in March of two thousand twenty we all woke to be deemed essential or non-essential. I have been flabbergasted at the number of people who've told me, oh yeah, I re now that you mentioned it, I remember it, but I didn't remember, I wasn't kind of thinking about it or I didn't remember it prior to you mentioning it. How did you not remember being that you're declared essential or non-essential and your career choice is basically essential or non-essential and you know what you do in the future. And I mean, all this stuff, I mean, it, it's so weird that people forget about these things. So I'm, I'm so glad that I document them in vivo. 
I wrote this book starting in March of 2020. And I was writing about it as the pandemic was happening, obviously. And um, so, you know, the book is not a reflective. It's an in vivo. It's while it was happening. And people just forget about these things, which is crazy. So I think the book does a good job of archiving or doing this thing of, of uh, identifying the sequence of events which people kind of blend together right now. So anyway, it's called Providence. Provenance is the correct term. I'll try to type it here. My, my uh, microphone in front of me, Providence. What happened first and then the sequence. But it's an awesome book. You'll love it. You will absolutely love it. So let me catch up here. Joe Dolio, Safe Doc, Aaron Clary, these books are range for strange. They were. So um, Joe Dolio, yeah, and check out like Clay Martin, obviously, if you add to that, Phil, Clay Martin, um, Concrete Jungle, Prairie Fire, Safe Doc, Aaron Clary. So yeah, Aaron Clary is a good friend of mine. Joe Dolio, a good friend of mine. So yeah, all, I think all perspectives of things that we saw um, unfolding in front of us that other people didn't necessarily see. And so we were writing about them and doing the deep research on them. Aaron Clary, 2008, I believe he released the book Behind the Housing Crash, right before the housing crash happened and the stock market almost imploded, including you know American economy and worldwide economy. Joe Dolio, who um, is adeptly looking at the incremental steps that lead to chaos in society as someone who was a former marine and you know martial current martial artist and things like that but to bring that in like a an analysis perspective so yeah i i like to say this constellation of books braxton mccoy Mar, um uh Sibley, you know, with his mongol moon and you know can bring in a few others but we have this constellation of books and you know it's not like the mike cernovich or stefan malin not, not, not kind of that or so or mike Rowe. It's, it's at this different level that we we have this this frequency right that we're at and i think we've we've got it right so if you're tuning into that right now into these types of books and these types of authors you're getting informed with authentic um verified information so uh, Vanessa saying, I'll donate your latest book to our I appreciate that, Vanessa. I am donating uh, two of my books, which I have over to my right. I picked them out tonight out of my stack. And uh, I will in, I will inscribe them. And uh, Thursday morning, I am interviewing them. The media will be there. And I am, I, I am, not I am donating them to my local library. I am, am inscribing them tomorrow. And... Uh, yeah, so I do donate a substantial amount of books. Actually, um, believe it or not, I do donate about one thousand dollars worth of books. Um, so yeah, which sounds kind of crazy, but I do it because you know the work is important. It's important for people to be informed, and I'm committed to it. So yeah, I I. <laughs> There will be a thousand dollars of uh, philosophy of information that will be donated. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> believe it or not, yes, believe it or not, Bacon. I apologize for yelling at your guests, which is coming. Oh, I don't know. So, um, a memo was written in 1883 for the command in Alaska concerning three threats from rats and mice on C5 aircraft coming into Alaska. So. This is from Shinobi Wan. Brother of the bacon. I like honey stinger snacks. I pour honey in my oatmeal, by the way. Big um, oatmeal guy. It slows down your metabolism of not your metabolism, your your process. It stays in your in your gut longer, in your system, it keeps your glucose levels stabilized. Inbound C5 informed com command that they saw a rat on board. Yikes! Any tips on dealing with food inflation on the beef I I don't have tips, John. Now I wrote in I'm a well, I like protein from peanuts. <laughs> Not everybody does, but I love I will eat a jar of peanuts in two days. I love peanuts. So peanuts have a lot of protein. Uh, walnuts, you know, 
kind of the Friday, but, um, and they're reasonable, right? Um, but I wrote in my book, The Velocity of Information, that 3D printing, uh, and, and so I don't want people to misinterpret this. I, I maybe should have identified this a little bit differently in my book, but we are coming to a point where your fast food restaurants are going to 3D print half the food that you order. It's just the reality. The white papers are out there. This is happening in, in other countries beyond the US already. Um, not that that's a bad thing necessarily, right? But you will have 3D printed meals whether it be restaurants, fast food restaurants, if you call, call them that, or like, you know, more formal restaurants that will take in your, I don't know, allergy or your intake profile or you can't have MSG or whatever it is. But 3D printing of meals will become more commonplace. So I wrote about that in the book, white papers from General Electric and so forth. Um, now, with that said, it's not that I'm endorsing that or I'm championing that. I just wrote it objectively in the book of saying this is happening. And I, I going back as I read through this, I'm like, I'm not endorsing this or, uh, you know, whatever of saying like, you should have a 3d printed steak versus a steak. I'm just saying this is where things are going. Um, and I think part of that is labor induced, right? Because if you can have machines that can print food, you don't have to have employees there to, warm up food or mix together or, or authentically at a high-end restaurant make food. So, um, and again, I think we, we are much further along on this conversion to a 3D printed environment than what we want to acknowledge, meaning that we have all of these supply shortages, right? Like those are definitely happening. We can see those when we shop. I saw them today when I was out shopping. Um, Part of those are, you know, attributed though to the transition right now from a warehouse, warehouse, we went to warehouse to just in time, we went from just in time to 3D printing. We're, so we're in this phase of moving to 3D printing. If you, if you are a major company, right, if you're a 3M or, you know, whatever, the future is 3M, uh, for, for 3M is, or General Electric and so forth, is 3D printing. It's not just in time manufacturing. So we are also caught in this weird phase right now where companies are are seriously thinking, well, yeah, supply chain, we could improve our just in time production, but in 10 years, we're going to be mostly 3D, meaning we're going to be doing it regional sites or very local sites or people will just be getting, they'll subscribe to us and they'll be 3D printing 50% of their shopping list from their home 3D printer. So we're in this phase and I, nobody has really recognized that. I wrote about it in the velocity of information, but part of the reason the supply chain stuff isn't rapidly improving is that if you are a major manufacturer, you're looking at this saying, well, we're headed toward 3D printing. So why not put more money into that than fixing the just-in-time manufacturing? Um, so we've got that going on, but yeah. Um, so 3d printing is here. Books, Bob. It's all right. He kind of had it coming. Hopefully. Wow. I don't know. Vacuum sealed separate O2 box. Yes. This memo was put out with the amount of panic emergency calls on the radio for myself as an inspector. Yikes. Um, evening. Doc. Hey, Cameron Sanchez. Hey buddy. Welcome. Can't cock the tuck. Andrew, I guess you're right on that. Rack can chew through three coatings causing major damage to aircraft. Aircraft can get back. Bubonic plague, yeah. I don't think we have right rats around here. Um, we have very aggressive squirrels. <laughs> Although, like, they're playful. And I've, I mean, outside of them chewing up the plastic edging on our yard, like, they really haven't been a nuisance. Um, so I, I consider them more entertainment. But, yeah. Um, I don't think it's a rat. I, I haven't really seen that type of stuff. Plus, we have an, uh, we have enough, like, you know, we have wild cranes that walk through the yard and gophers and hedgehogs and stuff. Excuse me. I think the rats would be taken care of. Plus, like, we have a 30, we, we have 100 feet between our property and this woods, which is just grass. So, obviously, like, if you're a rat, you're not going to do very well out there, though. 
the birds, the hawks, and whatever will take care of you. But uh, but yeah, John Steele saying or John Steele right here. Smash the like button. Yeah. So let's go in here and let's do this. God, I don't know if the controls change or what the hell's going on here. Please subscribe and smash that like button. Subscribe and a thumbs up for Doc. I appreciate it. We're doing fine with uh, subscribers, but we still need more watch hours. So if you have multiple devices and you want to just listen to the Doc, hey, a couple of weeks ago we had on Josh the Locksmith, we had an uh, intriguing interview with Lee Jarvis about uh, box theories. So give those a thumbs up. John Steele was a guest on the show. So appreciate that very much. Um, pay local farmers to raise some animals for you. I do. I makes sense. Yeah, we have a lot of local farms. We live 15 miles away from a large Amish settlement. Um, they made most of the furniture in my house. So um, that is also they have a dry goods store. Like a, it's big, um, but it's all you have to go there during the day because it's natural light through this ceiling translucent tiles so if you buy in bulk you can get great deals they only accept uh cash so great book doc everyone should buy in. yeah this is da, da, da. this is the book finesse is talking about also for those of you i know it's i mean 35 dollars. i know i'm asking you to do a, a lot to go on right now especially in these crazy times of inflation and to buy this in paperback for 35 dollars. but this book for, I mean, think of what you spend on a meal if you go out or something. But this book and the time that I put into this, the research and how curated this is, and I worked with multiple editors. I mean, we got this down to 208 pages. Like, it is boiled. It is the maple syrup. So as you read Velocity of Information, you'll be like, this is the best maple syrup I ever had. It is. It's, it's outstanding. And it's going to help you to identify... Um, the very intricate propaganda that is happening right now, and also to watch uh, and observe people around you as they hit finite voltage and kind of steer them away from that and toward resilience and anything you might be experiencing. It is a, and just the stories. It's a phenomenal book. Um, and then, yeah, so I promise to be the 69th interview review. I will hold you to that, Andrew. So I appreciate all of the, uh, reviews so um i'm hoping to hit that 50 mark by april 1st so which is weird that my publisher has moved up the release date to april 1st <laughs> so which is a friday as april fool's day it, from april 11th which is like 4 11th is a truth number for angels or whatever but anyway it's it's good for me to have it out sooner uh for many reasons but i don't know um uh send you Chicken, tuna, cookies, bacon. I don't know what's going on there. It's heavy water. Good buddy. Heavy water. Um, this is Vanessa saying, a copy shall be presented at our Board of Education soon too, especially at their fiasco early and changing by loss. Oh my God. I'm sorry to hear that. So um, this book, this book keeps coming back, right? This is my first copy ever of this book, by the way. But um, school boards, people who are on school boards, email me and they'll say, I got your book. And I've shared it with other school board members, and I've uh, it's used as an easement into these very tough discussions about school safety. And the discussions usually are tough because it's like we could spend three hundred thousand dollars on bollards and window films, or we could spend it on, you know, improving instruction. But um, and so this book has taken on its role, and people get behind it, and you know, buy it, or, or the boards buy it for the rest of the board members, and they go through and do a case study on it or whatever. But book review um so yeah this this has been instrumental i think in setting the tone for some school boards so i love that it does that absolutely love that it does that so yeah one of my one of my biggest um kind of fun times is when i open up my email in the morning and usually one of two things happens uh one is somebody will or, or people will email me and say hey like you're your PBS presentation was aired last night in Jacksonville or in New York City or whatever. And we, you know, I saw it. Here's where I live. And I want to thank you or 
and here's like a couple of questions I have or some like resources or whatever. But um, so that's cool because PBS keeps scheduling my 2019 into my 2019 PBS presentation into contemporary programming. Well, it's kind of done locally by the PBSs, I guess is how it works. It gets syndicated out, but I never know. Like I, I get up in the morning and people will, I'll see an email and say, hey, it was like in Little Rock, Arkansas or something like that, but I'm like, great. And it's funny, in my hometown, not my hometown, but the town I've lived in here for 20 years, I go places, I went to a small engines place and the lady behind the counter, she looked at me and said, you're the guy on TV, aren't you? I'm like, well, yeah, what are you talking about? Like, she said, you're talking about like safety stuff and things like that. I said, yeah, I'm the guy, I'm, I'm that guy. So, oh my God, like, wow, you're the guy. So, all right, um, anyway, I'm the guy. Um, but yeah, it is... Um, Let's go back here. So uh, Heath is here. Hey, Heath. Thanks, buddy. Ten accounts. Keep them going. If I can ever get monetized, that would be like a celebration here by cooling the gang. Heavy wire. Beats eating your dog. Yikes. Uh, nature printed mousetrap. Yikes. BB Luminous. Maple syrup season now. Yeah. It's happening here too. So the pu uh, public... Um, the city issues tapping permits for certain maple trees. I don't know how that works. I've seen it a little bit, but I have friends who like this is, yeah, you know, they, this is big for them. They get, really get into maple syrup season, which is cool, you know, Wisconsin. So um, I have maple syrup tonight. We have pancakes for supper. He said bollards. Everyone take a shot. And I have bollards. That's a, you know, I used to pronounce bollards incorrectly. Apparently bollards is what I said. <laughs> and, um, somebody, you know, said they're actually Bollard's Doc Pro and you might want to change it. So I did change it after that. It's our good friend, Flying Rich, who, uh, usually is out on the beach about this time. Flying Rich. Hey, yo, yo, yo. I want to Flying Rich back on the show. Flying Rich and I did a show. You can find it in safetyphd.com about how 3D printers can benefit disaster environments. If you brought in 3D printers, what might you be able to do? Such as printing geodesic domes for either shelter or storage of emergency assets. But I want to get Rich's opinion on, I think we're in this this in uh, this in between phase of a transition uh, out of um, just-in-time manufacturing to 3D printing. And I, I'm more and more convinced by the day that that is what's happening. So when we hear over and over again that the supply chain is broken and all this stuff, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of accurate. Like we're experiencing that, that's authentic, but we are also moving to 3D printed. That's a 3D printed environment, whether it be home or whether it would be you go to your local Napa auto parts or something. You're like, I need a fuel pump. And instead of going to the back and they bring one out for you in a box, they enter your, you know, your VIN number. And in five minutes, you've got a new fuel pump printed for you, right? So I think we're more toward the 3D printing. And that is the reason why people are perceiving that things are kind of languishing. I just think it's transitioning. It's a disruptive phase right now. Um, so I do think this will get better. Um, so let's go back here. 3D printed uh, compounds can make very efficient rocket and missile motors. Wow. I know they can print, um, they've printed metal engines already. So that's new all right so we are on we are only uh 54 minutes into the show and i will get to our topic <laughs> but no I, I really appreciate all of you in the chat um certainly do so and again if you have a good uh flexible uh hose a garden hose to recommend please put it down in the chat because i bought a swan hose to replace one that was consumed by squirrels not nearly the quality. It's kind of disappointing. So, um, yeah. All right. So on uh, page 144 here of the Velocity of Information, this book right here. So I'm going to check after the show and see if anybody has ordered this yeah, off of Amazon. I'd appreciate it, by the way, in paperback. Yeah, I know it's like $33, $35, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Um I don't set the price, by the way. The publisher does. Um, I'm going to read read a, a subset of a chapter. But there's something here called 
morbid, co morbid chaos. It's a term I came up with. One of the things I did in the philosophy of information is I identified four distinct, I don't know if they're phases, because they're not necessarily incremental. These can happen independent of each other. But there are four, I guess, let's say phases of chaos. Usually when you study chaos as a chaos theorist, which I guess I am, um, it's either, it's binary. You either are in a state of chaos or you're not, okay? And I I looked at that and I said, that's not exactly accurate though. I don't, I don't think that's true. I think there are definite phases of chaos. So I identified four phases of chaos. I had peer reviewers and you know, everyone's like, hey, this makes sense. So it's kind of new and groundbreaking in the velocity of information, which you should order right now off of Amazon. So when I go in there later and I check, it's like, hey, some people order this. It's hard copy. Well, don't order the hard copy. Don't spend $75 on a hard copy. Get the paper back. Tell your library, though. I'm telling you, this works. You know, email your local library. Say, I live in this community. And this book is necessary for our library to inform our, our patrons of how to interpret and build resilience to chaotic times. And your library will usually say, and people have told me this, I know this from the library industry, they'll say, yeah, like give our community members approaches that say, this is a book you should have. We will buy it. We'll put it in our library. You know, so um, do that. Help out Doc. So this chapter is called Comorbid Chaos in Dur uh, Intermediate Duration or Uncertainty. So let me just bring it up here so you can kind of see what I'm doing. So by the way, I have the best hose. Yeah, if you can, I'd like to do that because this one I bought, um, I don't know if I'm, I think just th put in a rummage sale or just throw it out. <laughs> so I'm just so disappointed with this thing. Although, like I said, the new LED lighting I installed is absolutely awesome. Uh, so let me let me show you what I'm going to be reading from. So this is the PDF of School of Airs, right here. So there it is, um, and there it is. So yeah, so this is the PDF of the book. I'm going to be reading through this um, right now. So let me make this a little bigger as I read through it, so you kind of get an idea. No, I don't want to make it 400 percent. Jeez, I don't want to make it 22,000%. Yes. 250. There we go. So you can see it. Okay. Yeah, let's do a little bigger. Okay. So this is on page um, 144 of my book. I'm going to read Comorbid Chaos, Indeterminate Duration, Uncertainty. So before I get into this, let me let me talk about this. So there's different chaos events, short term, there's intermediate chaos, there's extended chaos, and there's comorbid chaos. Comorbid chaos is very, very rare. That's when you have 90 days of a chaos event. And then also, in addition, other chaos events are happening at the same time. This is very rare. Again, like we saw it in the 1930s with uh, you know, Great Depression and then economics and also the Dust Bowl, like, you know, Southern U.S. But um, to have coal morbid or two chaos events that happen for 90 days or longer is very rare at a national or, or international level. We now, we now in the last two years have had two of these, which is unprecedented. So the two of these would be the pandemic and civil unrest, 2000 to 2022. 2022, we had inflation, kind of plus pandemic still hanging around there, plus war, right? Coal morbid national events lasting, international events lasting for more than 90 days. This is important to recognize because when you are in coal morbid chaos, which I'm going to talk about right now, people will not um, start new businesses during comorbid, you're not going to see small businesses. You're not going to see down in your town, like those retail spots, you know, of 1,200 square foot. You're not going to see anybody doing those. You're not going to be seeing people uh, take on advanced degrees, add on to their houses, stuff like this during comorbid chaos. This is a time when people are really like kind of 
collecting what they have and keeping things close, trying to ride out the storm. So let me, I think if I'm just trying to make this so it's easy for you to read as I narrate. So you remove, let me bring back. Okay, here we go. I'm going to narrate this. So um, comorbid chaos, this again is in my book, page 144. Comorbid chaos, intermediate duration, uncertainty. All right. The fourth state of chaos includes qualities of extended and international chaos events with the addition of one or more secondary population level chaos events that are intermediate and regional or extended and international. The secondary event happens concurrently with some of the entire primary event. So you have one chaos event happening, and then there's a secondary chaos event that happens during that time. And that might not hang around throughout all of that. It might just kind of pop up. But let's keep going here. So here we go. In addition, chaos at this level oscillates in intensity. For example, there may be civil unrest affected by Weather patterns, example, protests taper off on rainy days. Populations exhibit a lack of trust in government and authority. This is corresponding. Uh, this is a corresponding loss of credibility by those in authority due to changing narratives. Examples of comorbid, comorbid chaos involved the nine, involved the Great Depression from 1929 to 1939, confounded by the 1931 through 1939 Great Plains Dust Bowl and the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic in conjunction with racial justice protests. The Great Depression was the worst economic downturn in the history of the industrialized world, lasting from 1929 to 1939. In 1932, many politicians, businessmen, and journalists started to contemplate the possibility of a massive revolution in the United States. In fact, thousands of the most desperate unemployed workers began raiding food stores. At the store, the price of a chicken fell from 38 cents a pound to 12 cents. The price of eggs dropped from 50 cents a dozen to just over 13 cents. And the price of gasoline fell from 10 cents to less than a nickel. Wow. Wouldn't mind that today. Still, many families went hungry and few could afford to own a car. By 1933, when the Great Depression reached its lowest point, some 15 million Americans were unemployed and nearly half the country's banks had failed. Imagine if we had that today. Half of your banks failed. Wow. Economic stability gradually returned in 1939, due in part to government New Deal projects that reformed financial systems and put people back in, to work. Many people who lived through the era distru uh, distrusted banks and would no longer buy goods using credit. But before the economic improvement, the Dust Bowl intensified the crushing economic impacts of the Great Depression. In 1931, severe drought hit the Midwestern and South or, or Southern Plains of the United States. As crops died, crumbling topsoil from overplowed and overgrazed land led to powerful dust storms that pummeled the region. Residents crawled to safety in the dust, which was in summer dust storms and snust, winter storm snust. Many towns were abandoned. Hundreds of people, this is in the United States, hundreds of people succumbed to what doctors at the time called dust pneumonia, a respiratory illness caused by tiny inorganic particles in the windblown dust. Famine gripped the region as it was impossible to sustain livestock. Cattle went blind and suffocated. When farmers cut them open, they found stomachs stuffed with fine sand. In the fall of 1935, in the fall of 1939, rain finally returned in significant amounts to many areas of the Great Plains, signaling the end of the Dust Bowl. The positive weather change coincided with economic recovery stimulated by the New Deal to bring relief to millions of Americans. So, and then I get into another comorbid event, which was the pandemic of 2020, and then also civil unrest. So, but that is in the book. So to have comorbid um, crisis events at an international level is really rare. And actually from World War II up until the pandemic, like we hadn't had one. It doesn't mean that things hadn't happened. Like I write in here, you know, Europe in 2003 had a sweltering summer where, you know, thousands of people died and so forth. But um, to have these worldwide 
comorbid. Comorbid just means at the same time, but not necessarily related. So they're not causal. Um, they're just happening at the same time. Like the pandemic wasn't causing the social justice riots. Um, and right now, um, the in inflation and war, war are, are, are not connected as being relational, right? Like war hasn't caused inflation. It's exacerbated inflation, but inflation was there before Ukraine and Russia. Um, so this, this is incredible because it means in the time span of, of two years, we have now encountered comorbid world chaos events. Um, and that's, that's just un, uh, unusual, right? I mean, in our modern times, our modern thinking, we'd have to go back to 1930 for the last comorbid events. And now we have back to back 2000 to 2022 or 2023, however this will last, right? Inflation, economic strife, war. Um, so basically, you know, if you, from 2000 to now, the last two years, we've lived in this period of comorbid chaos, which means people are staying home. They're not traveling. They're not investing in themselves for additional professional development or entrepreneur type activities in general, in general, unwilling to, to move, um, so there are many things that, that come out in this. And again, we can see this represented in the downtowns in our cities, the vacant spaces or the strip malls uh, where people just aren't saying, I'm going to try to start something up. No one's going to try to start something up during a cold, morbid cast event. So um, delays in marriage, right? Delays in birth rate have been indicated in the last, you know, two years. So um, this is to, so you have to recognize it and recognize that people are demonstrating crowd in behavior or surrounding themselves with comfort items and cocooning themselves. And that's unlikely to change anytime soon um, because people don't anticipate that, oh, in a month, it's going to be better, right? Like maybe the Ukraine conflict will be done or the war will be done. And with Russia and Ukraine and, and uh, you know, inflation will, will subdue and gas prices will get back down to $2 a gallon or what. I mean, like people don't believe that. So when they don't believe it, they'll stay in this crowd in and it just slows everything down, not only from an economy, but just like people's personal decisions on what they're going to do in life. Um, so, but yeah, the, that chapter was right out of the philosophy of information. So it's our good friend, Robert Ribbit Harrison, Robert. I need to schedule my vehicles for oil changes, zero weight oil, by the way, but I don't drive much. So my, my Buick, um, I put on like 6,000 miles a year. So I'm at like 2,500 miles <laughs> in the last like six months. Uh, I'll get it in, get it serviced. Um, and we just, we don't put on a lot of miles. So our newer SUV, yeah. Safe uh, it was not the new deal. This is from John Steele. Got us out of the depression. What did was the U.S. start to mobilize the war in 1938. In fact, people were so disappointed. Yeah, you're right. And so when I wrote about that in the velocity of information, I wrote about it. Not, I, I didn't signify necessarily that the new deal was the, the propulsion event that got us out of the Great Depression. It was already the mobilizing for uh, war. But yeah, and the new deal, uh, they wanted a new deck. Yeah. So um, as we forensically look back at that, right, the New Deal gets gets championed as this this way to rise us out. But it was really the the recognition that at some point, which again was 1941, right, but the U.S. would be brought into World War II. Um, and the U.S. was starting to already, you know, build up their infrastructure to that. This is our good friend John Rice. Power just came, power, power, what kind of crazy storms? So, by the way, it's like 20 degrees here. So, like, I'm kind of uh, insulated from weather outside of being cold. So, low miles are good. Yeah. I'm full synthetic oil, garaged vehicles, you know, always take care of them. So, yeah, we get a lot of, a lot of years out of our vehicles. But, uh, Vanessa, I've not seen that before. This is an ongoing project to build up diverged uh, deeply. I don't know what that is. Oil change drive uh, April 1st. It'll be warm today. You bet. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of synthetic oil. So 
Um, yes. Yeah, and here, like, I just need to wash my vehicles on a regular basis to keep the salt off of them. So, because they salt like crazy. <laughs> you know, you live in Wisconsin, and I have a white vehicle and a black vehicle, and a black vehicle, you know, after they salt, just turns white. So you got to get that stuff off of there. Uh, I'm continuing my own version of crowd and behavior, whether things go normal or not. Yeah. So crowd and behavior, which I wrote extensively about, the Danish have a version of this called Huga. It's H-Y-G-G-E. I thought it was Heige, but it's Huga. Of where, you know, surround yourself with comfort items. Um, so uh, Robert is saying, especially gas 519 for 93. Tonight. Yeah, it's. I don't know, man. You know, thankfully, you know, we're not in a situation where we put on a lot of miles. Um, but uh, that wasn't a few years ago. And a lot of stuff I was doing is putting in a lot of miles. And that would have substantially impacted us. So, um, but yeah, this is this is crazy, crazy stuff. Homeless in America. By the way, Homeless in America, I think you, uh, you subbed over to my lecture channel. <laughs> so which is a channel you don't want to sub to because it's just university lectures. Uh, this is the channel to sub to if you haven't already. So I posted from that because I just got done uploading a lecture the other night and I didn't switched over 460. I was just, you know, when I was in high school, right? Gas was 77 cents a gallon. 77 because my had my uh, duster outside of a gas station. I had a picture of that in 77 cents. It was 90 cents two years ago. 90 cents a year. Um, like in April for a couple of weeks. So yeah, just crazy. So, um, so when we talk about chaos, comorbid or happening at the same time, but not necessarily causing each, each other. Right. So they're not related. Like one isn't necessarily causing the other, but they're happening at the same time. Um, comorbid events. It's kind of a weird term. It sounds really gruesome, but it's, you know, just what it is. Comorbid chaos, um, two chaos events. So one has to exist 90 days or longer, and the other one kind of pops up within while that other one exists. So think about 2020, we had the pandemic into 2021 and riots. So riots would kind of surface and they would kind of like, you know, uh, Rio stat, you turn them down for a while and then they kind of come back, you know. Um, so you had those two things happening, two chaos events. Of, you know, that happen over this multi month span, at least three months or longer. And that's very rare. We don't realize how rare this is until we actually study it. And when I wrote about in the velocity of information, it's like, you know, now it's, it's it, we've had this, this event and the book came out before like the current inflation, right? I mean, I had it to publisher in last September, but inflation and now the war with Ukraine involving the U.S. And, uh, you know, possibly, you know, NATO, how they all get tied into this and U.S. Uh, stock markets and just other things. But, um, but yes, yeah, so now we have two back-to-back -back comorbid events, which it, those are heavy hitters to the, to our society, to our economy. Um, those are, I mean, they're not knockout punches, but that's Rocky and Drago in like the, the 12th round. I mean, those are big punches that are coming out. So I've noticed it here locally, you know, the, the increase in vacant spaces in, you know, storefronts. And you do see this additional strain on the supply chain, which I wrote in philosophy of information. I said, you know, supply chain will, we don't really understand what's influencing that because the media is telling us it's, it's the pandemic or the pandemic becomes a low key, a low key L O K I is something that's from Norse legend. You know, some, your crops didn't come up this year. Oh, it's a, it's the God of chaos. It's the low key caused it. So the pandemic has been a low key for the media. Oh, the pandemic is causing a shortage of wheat or the pandemic is causing a shortage. It is causing increased crime or whatever, but so you just use it as a straw man argument. But the Loki now is saying Russia. Russia is the cause of inflation. Russia is the cause of increased gas um, prices. But this this is we people do not um, sustain themselves very well during these extended chaos events. They cocoon. They they start to 
you know, you're going to, again, it's this whole world of, of surrounding yourself with puzzles and Netflix and fast food to keep yourself comfortable and not really venturing out into the world because you don't know when it's going to be shut down. It could be shut down at any moment. You could be wake up tomorrow and all of us could be essential or non-essential again. We're not beyond that. Or, you know, on February 25th, ready.gov changed their um, page for, you know, what to do if you are in an area where there's a nuclear bomb detonation. Well, I mean, that was pretty graphic. You know, they had all the stuff in there. So people aren't going to be this entrepreneurial spirit is kind of dead, right? I mean, you have to be a little bit crazy to do that right now or like really insightful and, and see something that other people don't. So it's a good friend, Toy Town. Hey, Toy Town. Welcome, buddy. Uh, what happened to deep fryer oil gas? Use? It was a thing. You know, Heath, it's interesting you brought that up, right? They used to show people on the news who would go from like fast food to fast food place, get their deep fryer, um, you know, oils and stuff, and then like put it into their vehicle and run their car. So six bucks a gallon. That's crazy. About to drive new uh, North Carolina next week. Hopefully I won't pay that much. Yeah. From Robert. Yeah. I mean, again, it is, you know, incrementally, it's crazy to look at uh, over 12 months or 24 months where this is, where this is gone again, literally gas was 90 cents a gallon in my city in April of 2020. Um, so yeah, this is, and it's, it's weird too, because right now the like gas futures or, or oil futures are down. So oil is starting to come down yet. Gas prices aren't coming down. So, um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's affected us across the board. Yeah. I've had to look very carefully. You know, the I, I think a hidden cost that people don't recognize is your insurance, your car insurance, your house insurance, anything like that has, has gone up pretty sharply here. So uh, Vanessa saying, no, Russia decided to invade a sovereign nation at the same time, follow inflationary pressures in the pandemic times. So, yeah. So these comorbid things which are going on um, that now have a worldwide impact. Um, so the velocity of information does a stellar job of um, describing that. And it's not that you are you need somebody to tell you that this is happening, right? Because you're in the chat, you know, you understand this stuff. But but I, I position it in ways that give you um, a... a a different perspective on it. And then also a way to, I think, identify how other people respond to this and then how you can coach other people to move them um, ahead of the pack and out of harm's way. I think the book is an ex extremely valuable resource uh, for that. Um, so this is John Steele. Does anyone here know if all the uh, talk about shortage food uh, fertilizers and the precursors to about, if it's, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I've been a guest on um, councils for future conflict, so we know, you know, this is definitely happening. I was at a, a store today, a you know, large um, agricultural store, and yeah, fertilizers for domestic use were uh, definitely up. Um, but you know, at the same time, I'm not sure what the plan plan B is, and I'm not sure that the plan B is a is a failed option. Like if you didn't have access in the United States to um, external fertilizer, what could you do? Um, and and so I guess I haven't had, as John points out, I'm not very clear on this. And I, I don't anticipate this is going to be as bad as what has been portrayed. And the U.S. can also start to hold back and or to put into production some lands that have been paid by the U.S. government to not be in production. So. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to read all of, all of this. Um, so let's go back. Prices of everything have increased dramatically. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, the latest information I have, uh, Vanessa is, is, is basically, basically one month of income for every person for that inflation has taken, um, in the last year. So, uh, it's it's absolutely crazy uh, to to think about that, but yeah, one month of your income. So you've been 
inflation has um, devalued your worth by your economic worth by one twelfth or eight, you know, eight percent. So, um, yeah, finesse is saying I would predict. Yeah, I, I would say also, <laughs> right? Like, I think that's probably going to happen. And what is the long term consequence of that? You know, we saw, um, you know, the the Hong Kong, you know, and and China. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't think it's going to be similar to Russia, Ukraine. I, d I don't know. John still remember it. I walked through it. And even when a third of those chop goons were looking for me. So yeah, you had some crazy times. Bacon was going through there with a hammer, a roofing hammer in his vehicle, the great reset. I took those people's words. So yeah, you know, the thing, the thing, as I watch this also, comorbid cast and things like that but you have these other th things that are happening too like you know the much more open talk about a digital currency or a global digital currency and you know with what we've seen right where russian oligarchs or whatever like i have friends in russia who are just typical russian citizens right so they've shared out some videos and i've been in contact with them and they're actually saying like we have not seen a lot of changes in our Walmart equivalent stores. I mean, they already are calibrated to a pretty meager cost of, of life, right? I mean, um, but they're saying, you know, I don't really see like a lot of changes happening here. Um, but, you know, what is, what are we looking at for, you know, a US digital dollar or a digital currency? Um, let me bring this up here. Bitcoin price is currently, uh, yeah, it's down 2% today. I don't know. So, but it seems like it's it's uh, accelerating. I found uh, local sources for, yeah, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I'm good here with uh, firewood, thankfully. So, you, Andrew, so even my rhino sister regrets voting for our current president. She's going to grow food. Yeah, we have a robust garden. Unfortunately, we have a deer that come in our backyard, so um, can only fence off so much of that. But yeah, uh, fixed incomes and suddenly twenty five percent if you're at a cost, say four thousand a month and builder. Yeah, no, absolutely right, Vanessa. So um, you know that is that is real. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Well, not interesting, but like my book. The velocity of information releases at a, a very you know substantial increase in hard copy because it costs more to make hard copy. You know, I had to talk to the publisher and they're like, "Well, <laughs> it's a deal. Like, it's hard to get materials right now. So, I mean, we have to have this higher price point for libraries, which for me is a negative because people aren't going to be buying hard copies, which is a more you know legacy book, right? That you're going to pass on, but it's still out there in you know the other formats and things. But um, but yeah, I, I see this. And I, I my house assessment went up 22% in for this year. We got a letter last week. Our house went up 22%. So of course our taxes will go up 22%. And I have done nothing to the house in the last year to you know increase the value. And before that, it went up substantially. So our house value in the last three years has been on an exponential. Uh, hyperbolic growth. It's because we live near a major metropolitan area that is growing and we are getting caught up into that. So, um, you know, right. A benefit of course, right. Is that your property is worth more. A uh, drawback is you're paying substantially more in taxes and insurance for this property. So, yeah, I mean, I looked at that. I opened, I opened up that and it's just said market adjustment, right? It's not property improvements. So it's like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Um, but poaching will be making a comeback soon. Probably already is. Hunting turkeys begins April 27th. Yes. Died out when it became a felony, but hunger. Yeah. I've resorted, and not resorted, I shouldn't say, but like I've, I've revisited, you know, like I eat oatmeal, <laughs> which is, I can buy a, a a five pound sack of oatmeal, like very cheap at the Amish dry goods store. And 
I can, you know, mix in a couple things with it and whatever and and be self not self sufficient, but reduce my my cost. Um John's saying my HOA dues went up eight point one percent. That's before all this inf- yeah. So that's I don't live in an HOA, but right all of these incremental ways. And yeah, I mean I've I've looked at, you know, even you know, what the what inflation what measures we need to do as a family to keep up with inflation. Um, right. The show getting monetized, by the way, Vanessa, you can watch it on your seven devices, fill up the watch hour so we can get monetized. Um, this town is ban hunting. This is Vanessa. I used to harvest a great many gray squirrels. We have a lot of squirrels around here, by the way, uh, DNR around me is excellent. I wouldn't dare poach. So department of natural resources, heavy water is sharing that. So yeah. Um, let me go back and read a little bit more here from the book. So th- remember, we're talking about comorbid events, comorbid, meaning two events happening at the same time, cast events, and these happen 90 days or, or out. So if you have like a hurricane come in, that's not co- That's not a comorbid. It wouldn't qualify. If you have a blackout or something, it doesn't qualify. Wildfire it doesn't qualify. So you have to get 90 days or beyond. So these are pretty rare. But before we get there, by the way, couple whoa a couple things here is um subscribe um smash the like button which you've done 24 thumbs up i appreciate it buy this book right here uh 30 dollars hard copy it's supposed to be coming out in delayed paperback but my publisher will not tell me when that is they'll just tell me hey we've identified uh, the isbn number for it but we won't tell you when it'll come out so i don't know somebody you'll see it $30. This is a hard copy. It's a good print. It's got a sewn spine. It's a good book. Um, this releases April 1st. And how how did you get it, Doc? I went to the future in a DeLorean at 80, 88 miles an hour, and I brought this book back. Um, this is an awesome book. You will not regret this. Uh, in paperback, it's $35. I know it's asking a lot of you. And I, I, I understand. I don't set the price for these. Um, and know that like when doc gets these out in audio and stuff like that like i i'm not making a ton of of royalties that's not how this works it's out there for you for libraries and then as the audio comes in it's a lower price point and stuff like that but it's to get this out there um but you will love this book um i actually i i read this book a couple times a week um so just uh nothing out there if you like uh, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, John Ronson, Daniel Kahneman, like that book is right there in that constellation. So before we, and so some of you, are, oh, Vanessa is going to now tell you how awesome that book is. Before we uh, keep going here, I'm going to do another book read is uh, I need to uh, fire up the uh, wood stove. So um, I'm going to play our little intermission clip here. So I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. I have to fire up the wood stove. It's 16 degrees here. So, all right, be right back. Yum, yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack.
I am back. So I uh, put a few more logs on the fire, as they say here in Wisconsin in March. It's crazy, but uh, yeah, back. So I'm going to read a little bit more uh, from the velocity of information here on page 146 about comorbid chaos. So again, two chaos events happening at the same time, but they have to happen um, the chaos events need to occur at least 90 days or, or longer. So that's kind of the, the difference is like it has to be 90 days. So like a tornado hits your town, that's horrible, but that's not going to be a comorbid chaos event because the tornado doesn't last for 90 days. Um, here we go. Let's get into this. Another comorbid chaos event surfaced more recently. I have the big mantra on my left-hand side here. In late December 2019, an outbreak of a mysterious pneumonia characterized by fever, dry cough, and fatigue, and occasional gastrointestinal symptoms happened in a seafood wholesale wet market, the Hunan Seafood Wholesale Wet Market in Wuhan, Hebei, China. Little did the world suspect that what was happening in China was a forecast of what would happened the world over. On January 31st, 2020, the World Health Organization issued a global health emergency for just the sixth time in its 71 years of existence as human-to-human -human transmission of the novel coronavirus COVID-19 was quickly spreading across the United States, Germany, Japan, Vietnam, and Taiwan. Billions of people were ordered to stay in their homes. The COVID-19 pandemic led to a dramatic loss of human life worldwide and presented extraordinary measures to public health, food systems, and employment. Vaccine rollouts in early 2021 were credited with dramatically reducing cases of COVID-19. The pandemic was the catalyst for rapid adoption of telemedicine, remote work, and distance learning. The pandemic-driven social constructs of essential and non-essential workers will influence career choices for years to come. We need to think about that. The summer of 2020 also saw the United States' biggest protests for racial injustice and civil rights in a generation. Despite a worsening COVID-19 pandemic, tens of thousands of people took to the streets to demand change. First in Minneapolis and later in New York, Washington, Portland, and elsewhere. Anti-racism demonstrators also marched to show their support in cities overseas, including Brussels and London. Despite the media focus on looting and vandalism, however, there is little evidence to suggest that demonstrations have engaged. demonstrators have engaged in widespread violence. Regardless, the perception of violence persisted at many questioned the safety and advisability of mass public gatherings for demonstrations during a pandemic. As demonstrated, chaos is not a binary event, nor does chaos require temporal or geographic confinement. Certainly of duration and extent plays a significant role in determining which level of chaos state exists along a continuum. These factors make the difference in individual and population level perception of chaos, such as the difference between a bridge collapse and a world war or a pandemic confounded by additional chaos events. So... That is page 146. Yeah. Um, so going back and doing that, that's directly from philosophy of information. Um, so, yeah. 
So it's interesting. So dramatic. So when I had dramatic loss of life, uh, that has a footnote. <laughs> so it is a citation, <laughs> as you will go in and see that. Um, one of the curious uh, curious factor, right, is if you look uh, year after year deaths, as Bacon had in, is I guess implied here, but right. So that was a footnote in there, buddy. Um, but yeah. This is Vanessa. First tornado uh, to hit when I was young in 1978. Since 2010, we have we've had numerous tornadoes here. One storm caused four tornadoes uh, starting here, heading east. Yikes! Yeah, I remember a tornado when I was growing up in the 70s. I remember my dad calling me from the basement. We had a bomb shelter in the house I grew up in. It was built. The house was built in the 60s, and the bomb shelter, literally a bomb shelter, 18 inches of concrete, reinforced steel door to go into it. This bomb shelter. So it was double as a storm shelter. I uh, He called me upstairs um, from the basement, and we were at the top of the stairs watching this tornado like go by. <laughs> so it's crazy. Um, yeah. Hey, it's our friend Jim McIntosh. Well, howdy there, Jim McIntosh. Just returned from the store. He's loading up on wheat. Jim McIntosh. Cost to hire math teachers with the inflation of these requirements, pandemic conditions, driving prices extremely high for teachers. Yeah. Vanessa, I think... This is kind of a crazy statement to say, but I think we're going to see what well, we already see teachers in um, high needs areas, such as math, special education, speech language pathologists, OT, occupational therapy, physical therapy in schools, um, that they receive higher pay than, let's say, a third grade teacher. Um, it, that's happening. And it's been happening for the last couple of years. So now it's being exasperated, exacerbated. I think we will see in the near future, I want to say within the next year, and maybe it's happening already. Maybe the media just hasn't caught on to this yet. We will see an agent. Yes, an education agent, just like a sports agent. And he will ask, uh, you know, he or she will ask teachers to sign on. And I will get you a better contract in a neighboring district or if you're willing to relocate or whatever. And I think that's going to be a thing. I think you're going to see if you want to get a chemistry teacher, speech language pathologist, whatever it is in your district, um, if those people sign with this agent and the agent says, okay, here's the deal. Like, I will negotiate your contract and whatever, but I get like... Um, you know, fifteen uh, percent of it, or or upfront like seventy five hundred dollars or something. But I might be able to negotiate a contract of ninety five thousand dollars for you, right? Um, that's going to happen if it's not happening already. It happens already in the superintendent world, so I don't think it's that far from the education world. But uh, but I think you are going to to see that, and. Um, so yeah, maybe it's this whole idea of, of something like I have that I should like jump on and take advantage of, but I, I think that that's out there. Um, so yeah, um, teacher free agents, um, who will be signing with districts for like a three-year contract or, or something. And then it, their negotiation with the district will solely be through an agent. I completely uh, believe that will happen if it's not happening already. And I believe it will become uh, more caught up by the media mainstream. It won't apply to everybody. <laughs> it will not. And I'm, I'm just saying the reality of the things, like if you're teaching high school history, it's not a high demand area per your department of public education in your state or whatever. But if they identify these different areas, chemistry, industrial arts, um, yeah, you know, math, right? Things like that. They're going to say, okay, you know, you can go beyond your salary cap or your comp, uh, compensation liens for these people. I know that happening already in my state. I, I know people who have been, um, you know, rewarded with uh, substantial contracts just because of the area they're in. So, and to me, I, I feel no, uh, I'm not trying to say they didn't deserve that or anything, but, um, of saying a uh, one teacher is an equivalent to uh, another teacher is pretty much out in a lot of these these states 
And even new teachers getting hired on are getting more pay than other people. Some people are coming and saying, hey, like I've taught here for so many years. I need to be made whole, like brought up to where this person is being paid. They're like, nope. So we are in introducing this free agency, which would make a great podcast, right? I should, I should do that. I should talk about like free agency in teaching. Uh, especially now because we're hearing about it so much in the NFL, like all these free agents being signed and stuff. It will happen. Um, and if you're your own agent in some of these areas, you can demand a pretty high price tag and districts um, will acquiesce. They'll, they'll, or, you know, they will agree to that in a lot of situations because there just are no other options. Um, so I never thought I would see it. But I've I've I know teachers who have signed like five year contracts and they have bonuses in those contracts where if they complete their fifth year they get an additional um, payment right so so a stipend a bonus whatever it's called but yeah that's definitely happening happening um, Vanessa wrote math teachers semester year is not cheap the time to get it is yeah so where I live. And again, a rural growing urban area, substantial urban urban areas, like 40 miles from me. Uh, it is a bidding war for math teachers. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you want to talk about eighty to hundred thousand dollars a year. You've got it. You will get that salary. That's good money. Are they upset they don't make hundred K to wipe noses and doctorate children for say retired nonsense in schools? Um the whole school, um, um, the way that schools are compensating employees in these contracts is, is, is unlike anything I've ever seen. I've been in, in education for, you know, more than 25 years. I started private sector initially, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I could go, I could return now to education, um, in a very high income capacity. I mean, just, and there's always what the headhunters, right. That are, that are contacting me and, and say, would you come back and, you know, or would you consider this at a district or this or this? And, and, um, you know, so it's, and, and honestly, you know, recently I've, I've considered some of that, um, because the numbers that they put out there are just so, um, to me, they seem disconnect it with reality but it's it's kind of this weird reality of schools getting esser or these these funds um from the pandemic relief and just these other things and so i don't know i i haven't actually i have not ruled it completely out whether i would never probably return full-time um as a into school administration because i retired out of that but you know the the money is um is you know 40 percent higher than when i left right off the bat and you know so i look at that and i'm like well i i i don't know um so anyway um <gasps> whoa vanessa uh jim saying I'm sorry get holistic alternative message yeah so um some here this fall will add to future retirement funds for me so Good, good. Um, yeah, retirement age. Uh, if the meds develop to keep me alive. Um, so yeah. Um, Vanessa, I just added a fifth insurance in December. You do not want to know my health care. I'm sorry to hear that, Vanessa. Right, especially as a as a veteran, you know, I just strongly believe uh you know we should have systems uh, robust uh systems in place to to uh reciprocate um the appreciation as a nation to our veterans so i'm sorry about that um so yeah this is uh I'm vanessa saying to she's saying i turned 60 in december i should retire two more times by reaching 80 so yeah so, and for those of you who don't know, the doc here dun, 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 is running for political office. April 5th is the election. So I will either be voted in or not voted in. Um, 
I have one other person uh, who is running for the position that I'm running for. So we'll see what happens. Um, but I could be in political office here in uh, on April 5th. By the evening of April 5th, I will know. But uh, but yeah, no, I've I've seriously so the last of information he has out. I'm excited, you know. Um, Thursday, donating two copies to the local library. Media is going to be there to cover it, and then it starts to pick up, right? You know, all of the uh, the interviews, the Associated Press release comes out April 11th. Even though the book got moved up to April 1st, we kept it April 11th because um, the, the I was talking with the the AP folks are like, well, everything is going to be election based between really like, well, I mean, election, inflation, and Russia and Ukraine between now and April 5th. But after April 5th, you give it a couple of days, the election stuff will, will not be in the news cycle anymore. So I'm like, yeah, let's keep it at April 11th, um, which is a Monday. So that'll be the press release. So there'll be a lot of stuff that's kind of lining up behind that. But, um, but yeah, I've been, I've been contemplating, um, returning to some contract work. So I was a contractor last year. And when I contract, I say contract like for school administration um, aspects uh, throughout the country. So I have licenses in multiple states, right? But, um, and, you know, I didn't do that this year because I wanted to make sure that the book was finished and got to the publisher on time and, and also wanted to take a, take a break because last year it really ramped up. Like, you know, in a, in pandemic situations, like people just couldn't get enough and they're just kept asking, what did you take more and more on? And I did take more on and, uh, and the workload really, um, I was able to keep up with it, but it, it was, it was burning me out. Um, so then, you know, I just said, no, and they were sad. I think part of it is though, they get sad because of two reasons. One is you do an authentic good job, like you're competent and you do a good job. And I think the other part is they get used to you and they don't want to change to somebody else. So there's two parts of being sad is one is at Taurus, you're familiar with somebody. And the other is like, you just know, like if, if I work with you, I'm going to deliver. It's going to be, I'm going to give you high quality consulting. So in like legal issues of people, services, management, special education, so forth, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, actually I have my, my company set up on that, which is just me, <laughs> right? But, um, but I, I've, I've really thought about um, starting it back up in fall. And there's, you know, of course the clients are out there, you know, they're like, just let us know. But it is this weird commitment then. It kind of like, um, uh, well, you know, it, you you don't have control over your schedule as you once did because I retired, right? <laughs> and then like I came out of retirement during the pandemic. Um, and then I kind of re-entered retirement in this past year. And there's a there there, you know, there is something to be said though of when you're working, there's some agency and purpose to that. Like when I would get up at six in the morning and go down to the local gas station and get my coffee and come in and kind of set up my consulting for the day, which is all happening from right here in the studio. Like, you know, I'm not putting on any miles. Um, it was uh, pretty, there was something exciting about that. And, you know, um, so I don't know. And I I did that. Um, so is this spam bot? Hey, I know this guy. So don't, don't nuke him. Um, but uh, before you accept any teaching job, please bounce off Aaron Clary first. Record, please see. Yeah, Aaron Clary is a good friend of mine. So, um, yeah. So when I I instructed at a university, I do uh, three classes a year. They're all legal classes. They're all uh, six or seven hundred level classes, so they're advanced. Uh, I love it. I've been there eighteen years. So I continue to do that. Um, but if I if I return to uh, consulting, yeah, consulting is very lucrative, right? I mean. It just is. And especially I'm in Wisconsin. So if I consult in California, the base consultant rate is much higher out there than it is in Wisconsin because it's calibrated to cost of living. So I kind of benefit from that too. Um, so there's, I just don't, I, I don't know. I don't know if I want to get back into that. Um, 
I've, I have to, I have to think about it a little bit. I've probably have maybe a month to make some of those decisions because if I, if I'm going to do it, I need to let people know in spring before they sign with other consultants. Um, and yeah, but the velocity, of I don't have a new book in the mix. I'm not jumping into another new book. So, um, this might be the time to kind of get back into consulting. And I mean, f- I mean, frankly, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like with the, right. You know, with the economy and, and inflation, I went, I, I unretired in 2020 because I didn't know what was going to happen. None of us did. Like I thought, well, I mean, we could be looking at a Dow Jones drop of 50% and you know, all this other stuff. So like I had, I wanted to bolster everything for the family, even though we are, we're in good shape. I mean, who would have thought that was happening, right? Pandemic. And now I'm kind of looking at the same thing. Like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if global, you know, um, economies and where the U S economy is going, like if maybe I should jump back into the game, you know, I'm young enough, I guess, to do that, um, have the energy. I'm close enough to doing these things. It's not like I'm coming back like 10 years later and I can't, you know, you don't really relate to the changes. So I'm like, maybe, maybe I should do this. Um, so I, I've strongly debated that here the last, I think I have to sneeze, which I won't put you through cause it's very loud. So if I do meet the mic, you know, so I, mean, I, I, I might have to, um, you know, I, I just, I might do it. I might go back this fall and, and restart the consulting, uh, business. Um, just as a hedge against, you know, what could happen, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, if the uh, Dow Jones dropped 50% and uh, gas is $10 a gallon and, you know, a box of cereal is $8, uh, I'm not in a great position to handle that stuff um, with a family and, and ongoing. Um, so, and my, you know, property taxes of several thousand dollars a year. So, uh, I might have to go back into uh, into the mix. You know, fortunately, I did position myself to be um, be a consultant and be a licensed consultant. When I mean licenses, I have state licenses for my different educational degrees: superintendent, director of people services, things like that, that go across different states. So I've been licensed in different states. So then, when I consult in different states, in these roles, it changes the way that they can reimburse me and things like that if I'm licensed in their state. So, so actually, it's it's not. It would be very difficult for somebody to jump into that. There's a high barrier of entry, and so I position myself in my company very well to do that. A company of me again. <laughs> if everything you see here in this frame is in the company, that's kind of it. Um, but it, it and it it does, you know. To be, to be frank, I mean, it eliminates, you know, I don't have to participate in school board meetings. I don't have any trainings I have to participate in. Um, you know, so the bureaucracy of when you, when you are a 1099 or you're a consultant and you're talking specifically about things to districts, such as how do you do compensatory education for special education under the Individuals with Disability Education Act? I don't have to attend, you know, tra- uh, that's very specific on what I'm doing. Right. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a huge benefit. And I, you know, I enjoyed it when I was doing it. It was, um, you know, I thought the world had kind of pulled back from the brink <laughs> when I opted last spring to sunset my consulting. Um, and then also again, the velocity of information, you know, having to kind of work full bore through summer to make sure that that got to the publisher and got out. I mean, what a perfect time for that book to release right now. I mean, it releases in the midst of what is happening. It's just an awesome book. Um, so let's go through the uh, chat here. Connecticut, this is Vanessa, has consistently been amongst the highest uh, cost of living in the country. Yeah. 40K a year is not minimum wage, 15K. Oh, where's that, Andrew? So, yeah. Um. And, you know, and frankly, um, you know, the Dow Jones is, well, I mean, just investments in general now with international exposure, and you might not have thought a year or two ago, whatever, 
stock you own or funds you have, but suddenly if they're like, well, we're not doing business with Russia or, you know, whatever. It's like, well, that's a, you know, that's a big hit. Um, so, you know, where do you kind of make that up in your finances? If you're, if your retirement is dropping as you're withdrawing from your retirement, that's a really bad setup. Now I don't have that setup, but at some point I would have that set up. Like things would be made to transition to that. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm seriously looking at, uh, kind of getting the band back together here and, uh, starting the consulting business back up. And the thing is, um, yeah, I mean, all the structures are there to do that. So there isn't a lot to dust off to do that. Um, so I don't know. It's kind of one of those things where in where I live, like it's a great job to do from October to April because the weather kind of sucks outside and things like that. But in summer, like I don't want to be doing it. So um Talk it over. This is New York. Talk it over with family doc. We can't predict the future. We can't get lost family. Yeah. So my thanks, New York Outcast. So my, you know, my kids are older. And um, so that impact wouldn't be substantial, you know, like they're off doing their own things. You know, they're going to movies and their stuff. So, um, yeah. Uh, so it doesn't, it, it wouldn't have that big, you know, I, as one thing, like I would tell them, if people hired me as a consultant, I would say, there will be times when I will get a hold of you and say, I can't, I'm not going to consult on this day. And they'll say, why I'll say, cause it's going to be 85 degrees and sunny. I'm going to do a hundred mile bike ride. So we got to reschedule. And as crazy as that sounds, most people people would 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 pause and be like that's awesome good for you because they wish they could do the same thing and i'd be like it's just too important to me like this is a great day i'm going to be biking it's going to be sunny it's in the forecast you know a week from now we have to reschedule and i'll do it another time or whatever but you know it just is what it is and i couldn't have done that you know a couple of years ago but now i can and again i think more people respect you for that than sit there and kind of grind and say ah no they're like go for it buddy um so yeah okinawa god i i so regret i have uh my brother-in-law his wife is from japan so they go back uh, numerous times during the year to japan i so regret that i never went to japan i so regret that i did not spend some time in japan especially as a speech language pathologist initially you know with my master's degree that i could have worked a year in japan teaching english I just, uh, that is a, a big minus, like on the, on the going back into time. Like, I just wish I would have done that, um, you know, for the, for the experience and, and the culture. And, um, I was primed. I would have, it would have been, in, a, I would have been, uh, coveted to come in to, you know, teach English for a year or two. So, um, yeah. You know, it's kind of one, one of these things too. It's like when you get to be my age, right? Doc's age, um, the, the narrative changes. So people will say, well, like, you know, you can, when I was younger, when I was 40, when I was 30, people would say, well, if you don't like what you're doing, you can always change it. Like you're a talented guy. Like, you know, you're, you're really, well, I mean, right. It kind of, but, um, when you get to be my age, that narrative changes because you can't you can't just change. I can't just go to Japan and check out Okinawa for a year. You can't do that with a wife and family and a house and commitments and things like that. That's kind of gone. Um, so this is the thing with reconnaissance. Like Aaron Clary wrote in his book, Reconnaissance Man. I mean, like when you're 17, 18, 19, like you need to be aware of these things and stretch yourself and do some of these. Realize what's out there. Um, so yeah, that's really, that's really important. Um, so yeah, anyway, I, New York Outcast is saying, if I went to Japan, I'd go to Honda factory and thank them for, <laughs> for my old, no kidding, huh? So yeah, that's funny. That's, uh, I will get to UK. This is Vanessa, Ireland, Italy someday in my space, uh, available military graph once, but yeah. 
Yeah. You know, it's, it's, again, like, uh, you know, I've looked at this and said, there, there are certain things now that I know that I won't do in my life, which I don't, re well, I don't know if I would say regrets the word, but like, I, I'm likely not going to, very unlikely, not going to go to Japan and, and, uh, you know, Germany and visit friends that I have overseas and, and, uh, you know, Ireland and just some of these things that I want to, want it to do more likely I will fulfill some things that are more proximal, like, uh, going to Gettysburg in Pennsylvania, uh, which I, you know, had wanted to do and, and just never did, but now, you know, I'm going to make that happen and, and, and visiting some friends around the country and things like that. But, um, and I, you know, I don't feel like a ne necessarily a loss for that. Um, I do feel though, as, you know, as a dad, right. When my, with my kids being younger, I want them to try, um, try things that are out of their tourists, their comfort zone. Like my oldest daughter was going to go to Costa Rica. We had her all signed up. She was going to go to their class and then COVID hit and shut everything down and canceled that. Um, but I, I do want, you know, those experiences to happen. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of putting my things in order, you know, for some, for what I want to do here. But, um, so yeah, it, it is, it is quirky. Um, because as I, you know, as I said, I have to make a decision here in the next month if I'm going to to restart my consulting business. I don't know if that would have like an impact on the podcast or stuff like that, but um, it would have an impact on my time. And time is finite and all of that, but also like I I also feel it's really weird to not um, maximize that during uncertain economic times if that makes any sense, but I feel like, um, I'm leaving money on the table and it's more than money. I know I'm good at what I do. That's not a question, but I feel like I'm leaving money on the table and that is, uh, it's a little bit hard to just check off at my age, like thinking, well, maybe if I did this for another two or three years, like, I don't know, but, and again, I just, I, things are so sketchy. You know, like the whole, I'm, I'm, I'm just not, I am so not sold on, you know, stock market retirement. I'm just not there. You know, of course, brokers will say here, like, look at any 10 years and this is the return. I'm like, yeah, but look at January 1st to right now. Like that's never happened. That statistically has never happened. Adjusted like this type of loss and this international exposure and this international ability to freeze accounts and like what if I in investing in a company that has a something operating in a foreign country and then that gets shut down or even like McDonald's right now I mean like so you know like the one of the impetuses to shut down the McDonald's in Russia was because the people in Germany and I know this from my friends in Germany were burning the McDonald's to the ground. The last couple of weeks in protest so mcdonald's decided to you know that well i would assume like i figure that was part of their decision making for shutting down russia we know all of the u.s businesses have not boycotted russia though but um yeah so elk god you know i miss i'm thinking elk, i miss jerky whether it be elk jerky beef jerky um, rhinoceros jerky. I don't know about rhinoceros jerky, but, um, you know, beef jerky was pretty affordable where I was at up until like a year ago. And there's a beef jerky, Jack Link's beef jerky plant. We would drive by on our way up to vacation. And if you stop there, it's a small town at kind of a poverty area. And they have this, uh, Jack Link's outlet as part of a grocery store and you could buy massive amounts of beef jerky for very little money like 10 percent of what it would cost you in a retail store and so the, a couple of years ago we went up there and i just loaded up you know like just fill up the trunk with beef jerky and uh i don't know if it's that way now but i plan we're gonna stop there again um so yeah that is uh 
but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't feel like I don't feel right biking and packing ten dollars worth of beef jerky. It just kind of goes against everything I just kind of stand for here. But um, yeah, let's go to the to the chat. Elk is delicious. I had a when I was a school administrator, one of my students, high school students, well, right, the student does, brought in um, bear jerky. And uh, it was okay. It was just really uh, fatty and greasy bear jerky. So he shot a bear and he's like, here, here's some bear jerky. So he peppered it up pretty good. So I mean, it was seasoned well. It was just like really kind of, kind of fat and greasy. It wasn't my thing. Um, so yeah, jerky. I need to, there isn't a good place to get discount jerky. Again, except on when we do this trip up north. Um, but that's one of those things, too, where I'm kind of like, well, not that I couldn't afford it, but I just it's it's a psychological thing, right? Like, I don't want to spend $15 between jerky and other food or $20 when I'm going out on a bike. If I do three bike rides a week, like $60, it just seems weird. Although, like, if you looked at it a different way, it'd say, if you're a member of a health club or whatever, if you're getting physically fit and take care of your body, you're not having medical bills because of, you know, your fitness, it's a bargain, right? I just don't see it that way yet. Uh, heavy Water is saying, the worst meat is snow geese. Stay away from snow geese. New York Outcasts, if the kids and wife don't care, then definitely put some extra time in. Save or invest in something you personally can control and possess. Yeah, I think, you know, and personally, I would. <laughs> I, I am a dividend stock investor. That's kind of my thing. And uh, I would I would likely continue in, in some of that. Um, so, and I, I don't know. I see that I bonds right now are like 7%. They're all interest-based, but, you know, eventually if, if they adjust it back down lower, you could cash them out, right? I don't know. Um, there isn't, I mean, I'm doing some upgrades to the house this year, like the concrete pad on the side of the house and or the garage and the concrete curbing around the, the landscaping stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I could upgrade the kitchen. I could put some money there. So into hard assets. Um, but yeah. Oh my God. Beef jerky generates. That's so cool. Like, Ah, man, I love beef jerky. Jim McIntosh, that's like uh, not saying water and wine don't go together in cold weather training. Attributed to the Romans. So, yes. Vanessa, setting the recumbent trike up for my fishing adventures. Nice. I'm going to get a recumbent uh, bike at some point. Um, the thing with... So I have, I have a current traditional bike, um, touring bike. But uh, once you're out for a day, you know, once you're out eight hours, 10 hours, like that, it, th as I get older, like the, pos the positioning of that just puts a lot of pressure on your wrist in that kind of setup, even though I have like a graphite front fork that absorbs a lot of shock and stuff like that, but. Uh, New York Outcast with some advice. You never put all your eggs in one basket. Absolutely correct. Yeah, I've tried to uh, to spread that around the best I can. Um, so, uh, so far, you know, it's, it seems like a, a pretty viable plan, but yeah, it's good advice though. Um, and, you know, one of the things New York Outcast that amazes me is how significant financial financial advice or financial knowledge is to every person from whether you're getting a car loan to a home mortgage to investing to retirement investing like we don't have classes in college about this we don't study this there aren't clubs there's not like an elks club or a jc's for investing right um this massive amount of our life which you're you're basically told to either manage it on your own or hire a consultant, which is either if you're going through, you know, a paid brokerage, they're selling you stuff 
you can get a, you know, or a CPA with investment expertise, which might be a little bit different, but like each of us should be spending five hours a week studying investments, our fiscal, you know, options and opportunities and just like understanding investments. Like uh, what is a bond? What is a short sale? What is a municipal sale? I mean, all of these things, interest in, and we don't. It's just, it's not part of society. Like I sit there and and look and say, God, I wish I would have known back in December that, yeah, I bonds were paying 7% or something. And it's so weird that, again, and, and how how easily we outsource that to to other people of saying, oh, here, manage my <laughs> my future. It's really, it's really weird. I think I'm doing a patio this summer. A quote today from Smith, fifty six hundred. It was well, yeah. That's about what my side. That's that's kind of my quote from last year. Now, thankfully, my uh, my cement people are sticking to their quote because they could not get here before the weather changed and they couldn't. They they were unable to get the the work done. But they they were telling me straight up if um, you were to quote this out fresh today, it'd be sixty percent more. So it's kind of weird too because even though I'm having this done, my property value, my house value went up twenty two percent. So um, it is the area where I kind of set the chair in front of my garage and just like hang out in the afternoon and just in the old guy watching what's going on. Uh, so yeah, this is New York. Okay. So if the system has issues, it's best to have something on hand. Historically, has happened. Yeah, no kidding. Um, no kidding, buddy. I am. I'm with you there, um, Vanessa. If I work ten at state level, I can buy into the retirement system another twenty years net worth. My time in the USA, F Air Force and retirement time under presidential orders and war time teaching. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. Like I have some of that because of the years I spent in working uh, basically for the state. And then there's some capacity to add to that. Um, so kind of this whole kind of blend of things. But uh, I spent about 10 hours a month tracking my investments. Good for you, buddy. Uh, Spambot fighter, which is absolutely critical. And I have multiple spreadsheets that I've made on my own to track not only my finances, right? But just to track general kind of trends and economic things, whether it be bond rates or T rates or municipal rates or uh, certain stocks I've been interested in that pay dividends. I'm a big dividend. I'm a believer in dividend stocks. And here's why. Again, it's not financial advice. So I'm not going to tell you any stocks, but dividend stocks, um, it, you can look on aristoc aristocrat dividend stocks. So these are stocks which have for like 50 years always paid a dividend, even through the pandemic. And they've traditionally increased their dividend. So if you buy a stock for, you know, $100 a share and it pays a $4 dividend, then every year you're getting for your, let's say you buy 100 shares, $10,000, you're getting $400 back. And then it reinvests. You can have it either, either paid to your reinvest. I always have it reinvest. So it will buy $400 worth of shares, whatever the share price is, right? So it's quarterly. So, um, But then on those shares, you're also getting dividends, right? So as you continue through time, like right now with the market being down, all of the dividends are being reinvested. You're getting more shares because if your stock was $100 and now it's 80, you know, you're getting extra, you know, extra shares, like 1.2, right? So... It's okay if you're a long investment holder of dividends because in a down market, you just lower your cost average on that. So, and at some point in time, you know, 15 years or whatever, 17 years, like the dividends basically pay you out what the, you bought for the stock. So you're kind of paid back to even. And the stock can appreciate too. I mean, the stock can go up. So you can have the stock going up in value plus your dividends. Uh, so I believe in that. I believe, but I go through in companies and I'm big in utilities. I love utilities. So companies, you know, that are electric and water and stuff like that, because the pay dividends, uh, that's hard infrastructure. You just can't jump into that. There's a barrier to entry. Um, so, and people need that stuff, right? 
So that's my own thought. I've been there, you know, for gen, uh, for decades here for the safety doc. Um, now, granted, you know, you're not going to, you are not going to hit on something with that mentality that's going to go from a hundred dollars a share to five hundred dollars a share. It's just not going to ha likely happen. But with with those dividends uh, coming out, and you know, some appreciation, you can do pretty well. But I like dividends. It's not maybe it's just kind of my philosophy. It's my been my approach. And again, I'm a heavy utility person. I mean, if you're building a nuclear power plant or something like that, like it's a high barrier of entry to get into. Um, so and you look at these stocks, I mean, a lot of these stocks are paying four to five per four to five percent, you know, interest. And uh so anyway, it's some it's something that I've stuck with for 20 years and it's served me well now other people could say right they could be well if you would have invested in this profile like you'd have significantly more I'd be like true under that profile but like right now maybe not um or if you would have done this you'd have i don't know it's just for every person but um i don't think there's enough knowledge out there about uh you know dividend investing so Anyway, you just have to go, you just type in dividend aristocrats, and you'll find businesses that have been out. Here's one, IBM, which I don't own, uh, which I'm interested in, but I don't own IBM, which pays like a 5% dividend. So, you know, now they're getting more into cloud computing and they've paid dividends for like, what, 50 years or something. So, um, but it's, that doesn't necessarily track inflation, but anyway. Spam bot. Tracking time is 10 hours. Any changes on top of that? Whoa. Uh, Jim is saying, you could sit back on porches and shoot a deer. Yikes. You could probably do that in my backyard if we have deer here often. It's in the city. So, yeah. I don't know if they let you keep it. American American Waterworks is one of my favorite stocks. It's gone up 22%. So, yeah, see. Um Util yeah, it's good for you, Andrew. Yeah, so, you know, utilities have a high barrier of entry. So that's one of the things I I, I th think if we're talking investments, again, it's not an investment show, but just in common sense, if I'm selling, so if you have, if you're selling like a Facebook type thing, right? Like somebody else could come up with that and there's probably not a high barrier of entry. There's like, you know, you, you could probably have, 50 people, servers and things like that. And you could come up with something to compete. It's some entry level. Now, though, if you're providing water to my house, right? Or, you know, electricity, uh, natural gas and things like that. Like you have to have, you know, the, the pipelines, production, all of that stuff. Like that is a barrier of entry. And I, I really believe in this. The, and it's regulated, too, by the federal usually state governments. So things that are regulated and have barrier of entries that pay like a 5% dividend, I'm pretty happy with that, um, to be honest with you. So it's kind of the old doc talking here. 5%, it, it is. Yeah, yeah. Again, I don't want to get into what would be called financial advice, but I could name like 10 stocks right now, you know, that dividend stocks are out there easily 5%. Um, so, and again, if you reinvest those, you're buying shares. So if they go, and these things are always cyclical. I mean, if you look at them over like a 50 year span, it's like when there's electricity demand, like, you know, heat wave, they go up. And when there's less, it goes down and up and down. But, um, but nobody talks about this. Never had a class in high school or college or like even friends or even like an investment club. Uh, so yeah, I had a relative who was an investment club back in the seventies and eighties and did really well with that. That was back when you would have to open up like the uh, Wall Street Journal to see the difference in a stock from day to day. It wasn't, you couldn't find it on the internet. So, uh, yeah. Heavy water saying, last season, one day, my wife, I was at a baby shower in the Burbs, sent a pic of a 10 point buck uh, while I was in a tree stand seeing nothing. That's, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Wow. Vanessa is saying, I worked at a paper mill that had the highest return in investment at the time in a retirement fund. That was the fastest earning one. Yeah. Yep. So, absolutely. I mean, some of these hard assets. So, around me, like this is big paper mill country here in Wisconsin. Uh, some of these mills have 
have shut down. But at a time, they were uh, strongly uh, producing. Um, so all those paper mill in the country, says Vanessa. So, yeah. Uh, GameStop has a 9% dividend and Microsoft uh, apes been over the... Yikes, Jim, yeah. So I'm, you know, where I invest typically, I don't invest anything that I don't intend to hold for 10 years unless there's some crazy thing that happens in the industry, right? <laughs> you know, someone does, you know, invents a Mr. Fusion and suddenly power companies are on the ropes, then I would be out of that. But um, I usually go with like a 10 year plan when I, when I get in, into stuff, but you know, right now, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunities. I'll say one, cause I don't own it. Honda motor company trading about $30 a share. I don't know. I haven't checked it today, but, um, like a 4% dividend. Right. But you know, Honda is, I, I, I think on, I mean, that's a great value. I mean, I think Honda is, has a bright future ahead. That's a strong dividend. Um, so yeah, Andrew's saying, if you can find out, uh, there's Twitter account that spans with Nancy, right? No, that's true. <laughs> uh, Andrew's saying, Hey, I hate utility companies. This is damn monopoly in my area. I had a place once that a custom owned company for the area and the bills were ridiculously low. The big companies rip us off. So yeah, we'll tell you, I'm not talking about the ethics of all of these companies and stuff, but I will say that the stability of investment is typically there with, I've experienced personally with um, utilities. So, um, yeah. But, so utilities, yeah. I don't know. I'm, uh, I don't know. I mean, it gets, it, there's all this weird thinking, right? Because you, you can be like, well, I can invest in this, but what if the, uh, you know, what if the government freezes just some accounts, right? And just takes so much off the top or whatever, or um, every, uh, you know, so there's so many variables now that are like, how do you, how do you kind of cover the basis? I don't know. Vanessa, I drive by Boston Dynamics, Dynamics the other day, hoping uh, that the spot, to the robot for math class. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Boston Dynamics has those awesome videos they put out on the web. So that's funny stuff. Uh, yeah. No, I'm I'm with you. I'm, yeah. That's one of the things, like, when you're investing, you have to separate your emotions from the company. And one of it, too, like, as, a, as somebody who invests for 10 years, like, if I buy some, as an individual security, if I buy something, I intend to hold it 10 years unless there's something identify that's catastrophic right <laughs> um you know so yeah this is bacon saying tom like is saying buy more in home lows or home depot yeah it makes sense those go up if you look at utility stocks um on the east coast or west coast a heat wave hits the utility stocks jump so i mean then it, i mean if you're trading in and out of those maybe i don't do that but i mean you can cyclically look at those um but yeah, so it's, I don't know, it's interesting. It's so, I, I think there should be something for retired people. If you're 55 or older, you should be able to put um, up to like $200,000 a year, not $200,000 a year, $200,000 total into a, a bond, a government bond, which would pay you like six or 7%. I just think that should be there for people so they could plan on that, like, you know, retired people. Um, and instead, you know, what do they have? Like an EE bond, which might be a half a percent or an I bond, which is just completely inflation benchmark. So you, it might be great now, but it could be zero a, a year from now. But I think there should be something like that. I mean, if you're 55 or older, that you could have this special bond, this access to this one, you know, bond. Like an I bond, you can buy like what ten thousand a year, I think. But maybe you can have a maximum investment, and you could get a interest rate from the federal government of six or seven percent. So if you had two hundred thousand, you get fourteen thousand a year. But um, I don't know. 
I think it makes sense to stabilize things out for people, elderly people who are living on a fixed income and all this crazy stuff that's happening. Um, but again, who am I? Just the safety doc with this book, which heavy water, you want to buy this, get the paperback order tonight. John Rice, you're thinking about New York Crowdcast, bacon, guys. Andrew, thinking about it right here. Jim McIntosh, right here. It's an amazing book. It's amazing. So, um, so a recap, I am uh, feeling kind of uh, disappointed in this hose that I bought today. It's by Swan, company Swan, called Soft and Supple. And uh, I had one, but it was eaten by a squirrel, so I had to throw it out. And uh, this one is, like, I, I hooked it up today to the hose reel, and like it's all kinked up, and it's just like... Like this just is not that good of a hose. Like, and, and there were many hoses to pick from, um, and I'm like, none of these are really good. Uh, <laughs> like, you can just tell how they cheapen the quality of these these hoses. So, um, I mean, this is a hose, right? But, uh, well, yeah, I, I'm uh, heavy water. I will I will follow that. I'm I'm close to just ditching this hose, of just like throwing it away. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and I also bought the LED, uh, lights, the shop lights, uh, for my furnace room. And those are amazing. It actually has like a, a setting for like low or high. And I'm like, the thing was a thousand times better than the old fluorescent tube thing I had in there. Uh, it just, um, for like 50 bucks, I'm like, holy smokes. Um, I have it set. Yeah, it's like a low. I have it set on low, like on high. It's just like it's crazy bright. Um, so that's cool, and you can daisy chain them. So they just come on. Like I have it. I have the outlet on the that's they plug into is wired on the switch for the lights. So I don't know the small things that make Doc happy. Um. Yeah. Well, no, I'm definitely going to the hose. It's called a Swan hose. The company is Swan. I don't know. It was like forty-five bucks or something, hundred-foot hose. But it was. It's called Supple, soft and supple. And the thing's not either of those. Um, I just, you know, jeepers, and it just like it was just a mess, all tangled up in like all these. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so I'm kind of stuck and it's kind of this like iffy thing. Like, I don't want to put a, it's a hose for the backyard. I don't want to put a lot into this investment, especially now that the squirrels have kind of taken, they, they've gnawed up the hose. The thing that contains the hose has been like eaten. Like there's parts of it. Like they've just gone through and chewed up, which is okay. That thing's kind of old and it still does its job, but like, I don't need them to be, uh, going in there and eating up another hose. But uh, that sucked because um, I've got a hundred foot Goodyear hose. Oh, God. Yeah. See, like there, like that would be great. I think what I would do is I would buy like a really good hose. So like email me. I'm here in the YouTube thing. You can find my email. But um, if you've got a link or you're like, here, get this hose on Amazon. I've had it and it's great. That's what I appreciate. I would um, I would move it to the front of the house where that's the hose that washes the vehicles and stuff like that. And I've moved the current hose in the front to the back. So it's kind of weird. Like a hose shouldn't have that big of an influence on things, but it kind of does. Uh, Jim McIntosh, I mean, one to five years older. So um, is Alex Patino. Crappy Chinese. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it it is just really... Uh, yeah, it's kinking. It's got, you know, so as I wind it up, like, and I try to, like, you know, remove the kinks, like, very carefully with the pliers and some cardboard to not, like, leave a mark on the hose. And, but I'm like, this just sucks. Like, you, even when I was in the store, I'm like, this isn't a great hose, but I didn't want to spend, like, a whole bunch of money on a rubber hose for, again, what's the backyard? And in winter, I mean, so I take in the holes reels in October because it's Wisconsin, right? I mean, there's no need to have a hose outside unless you're fighting a fire. Um, and then they sit in until now, 
and then I bring them back out for spring. So in winter, they're not out there. It's just that in, so it's really April through October they're outside. Otherwise the hoses all come inside. Um, but yeah, that thing was damn disappointing. Like I, I regret that I bought it to be honest. Um, so I don't know. Um, anyway, just irritating. I don't know if they take it back or not. I don't know if I want to make the drive to, to take it back. It's all kinky, right? So this is a kinky hose. I'm not, a, I don't appreciate this hose. I don't know if they would get all grumpy about it or not. Like, I just think it's better to just like, if I decide to get rid of it, just go on. My workshop bill will allow me to build an insulated shed for the well pump. We're trying to keep the wall running year round. Awesome. Bacon saying, hey, hoses with kinks can command a premium price. Yeah. There was something on the front of the hose packaging it. It said there was a review and it, and uh, something like this hose uh, doesn't uh, get kinky at all or something. I'm like, that's kind of a weird review. Like, I'm not sure I would put that on the front of my my product here, but it does. It's uh, a yeah, hundred foot hose too, because I have a big backyard and I need to be able to kind of cover that area for different purposes. But uh I don't know. Here, I shouldn't be upset about this, right? <laughs> I should. It should just be rolling off. It's a hose. It's hooked up now. It'll probably be functional. Um, I guess what I'm. It's nostalgia. Like I'm just disappointed because the hose that I took, uh, uh, I dis. You know, I, un I disconnected it today and threw it out because it was eaten by the squirrels. I'm like this. It just was better. It was a better hose, and the only reason it gave up the ghost is because the squirrels ate it. And I'm like, why can't I get this today? Why can't I, I find this? Like, even if I'm willing to pay a little bit more, why is it not out there? The transcript of the show could sound really around. Yes, it could. We'll see if uh, they put that out there or not. So, yeah, hoses. It's disappointing. Who would have thought? It's a young man. No one ever talked to me. Hey, when you eventually get a home, garden hoses. So... It's just disappointing. But yeah, like the shop light though, holy smokes. That thing is awesome. The new LED shop light, re you know, replacing the 30 year old fluorescent tube, you know, thing down here, which in my uh, furnace room slash wood area slash pantry, like holy smokes, big difference. Um, so yeah. Well, um, let me tell you kind of what I'm up to right now is so I'm recording the velocity of information in audiobook. My, my, well, I'm narrating it. Uh, there's a studio in my town, a professional sound studio. So I go there Wednesday and Friday mornings. And then a sound engineer sets me up in a booth and listens as I'm recording. And then in real time tells me, like, repeat this sentence or whatever um, to make sure we get everything right. And, and then uh, he is uh, producing everything down into the files. So I'm working with Bindaway um, Voices. So that's my distributor. And I've loved working with them. So I'm, uh, they're doing both books, but uh, Findaway Voices. So um, School of Airs will release. It'll be like an Audible and Google Audio and whatever, Nook or whatever that the audio stuff is out there all over the world um, in libraries. But, um, but yeah, I am just, uh, I've, it's been a great experience um, so far with uh, find away voices. And I said, October, August 1st for the release, but likely it'll be before that because everything is there for like, I should have all of the files by June. And then there's really not much to do. Like I have the cover art already. And there's a PDF, which will be the, what is it? The bibliography will be in there. I don't have any figures in the PDF. So that'll, I mean, it'll take me like a day to produce that. And so I could release it earlier, probably in July and get it out there. So um, it's me, it's my voice though. It's right, it's me narrating. So, and um, it is fun. Um, 
to do this. And I practice and I listen to myself at night. And it, the one thing is you build up endurance because to narrate, a, at least for me, like if you're a professional narrator or whatever, and I, you don't, but for, for me, I found it was very difficult to keep, uh, my voice would start to get raw, breathy, stuff like that. It had 40 minutes of narrating. And so I practiced and built up my endurance. So we go between like 80 minutes and like a hundred minutes of narration. And then there might be, then after that, I come out of the booth. Well, there's periodic breaks, but I come out of the booth and then the narr the audio engineer has a complete trans has all of the book as a paper document. So he's going word by word and then he'll say, okay, sit down and, uh, okay, I'm going to take you back to the booth and here are, you know, 15 words I want you to repeat. Right. And then because when I said them, whatever, they weren't as clear as they needed to be or something. And then I'll repeat those and he'll just like, you know, bring those into the document. So, and then usually I stay for the first uh, part of the mastering of the files where he's editing them just to kind of check out. I, he, he knows what he's doing, right? but he's just kind of showing me like, here's where, here's what I'm trying to do with this. Um, and then, yeah, so it's cool. It's a legacy item to do it. My, well, it's two things. One is the publisher wouldn't have allowed me to do it any other way because that book did not have exclusive auditory rights in it initially, but, um, it's a legacy item like that'll always be out there in my voice. And for my kids, it's kind of cool to have something their dad had narrated. And then also for all of you who enjoy the book or enjoy my work, I mean, that'll be very affordable. And and uh, so you're going to hear kind of what you hear tonight in a much more coherent, <laughs> sensible way. But um, so that is that is cool. Um, so I've enjoyed it. I've, I've really enjoyed the work on that. And then the end product and... I never, you know, these things like I go back, I, I took a long walk. I was walking, first of all, this is, uh, uh, Vanessa said, audiobooks give access. It does. More, and I had to go with my publisher. We kind of went round and round on this because they initially didn't do school bears and with an audio option. And I said, I, I worked at a school for the blind for four years. Like I have friends who are completely blind and they said, you know, audiobooks um, are much different than just having a text reader go through a, a book because that's where my publisher was at. Well, we have text readers for all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, it's not the same though. Like, trust me, like I work with, you know, kids and adults who are completely blind. Like audio is a different experience. And plus just if you have barriers to print or you just prefer to be doing other things, you're driving or you're working, you're doing something, you want to have this on in the background. Like it's a way, I love audiobooks myself too. Like I didn't understand like the big barrier to entry uh, with this. And then when I did some velocity information, I had it built right into the contract. But um, but yeah, it is it is really cool um, to, you know, to, to, to do that, to have that book out there and to have that available. Uh, so I'm excited about that. So I go back and I look at the last 10 years. I took a walk the other day. So I'm, I, if I walk around my town, it takes me a few hours and it's like a seven, eight mile walk. It's kind of weird because where I live, like when I walk around my town, I walk past lakes. <laughs> I walk past an airport, you know, I can walk past a hospital. Like there's so much where I'm at, like it, it, you can quickly get out into the country. Um, so it's, it's, you know, an interesting walk, but um, I was, I was thinking like the last 10 years for me, I've done two PBS presentations, two books, and I will have, if I take, what is it, 2013 to 2023, there will be two PBS national presentations, two books, worldwide distribution, and two audiobooks, worldwide distribution, which is pretty awesome professionally. Um, so I'm kind of like, boom, like that's like that, that 10 year sliver right there of a career is uh, really contributed a lot to the scholarly base. So, um, Jim's saying, I used to be an Amway. I failed that, however. I love their educational tapes. Yeah, my brother was an Amway for a while. So, back in like the 80s. So, 
Um, so yeah, so Wednesday morning I go back to the studio and we continue to record and, uh, and I'll, I will be completely honest. Um, that recording an audiobook is the, the, I would, I don't know how to describe it. If it's the most intimidating, um, professional thing that I've done, like presenting on PB, you would think presenting on PBS before a, a live national audience would be crazy maddening it really wasn't at all um like i love that stuff uh, but the audiobook stuff is was very there's a, you have to prepare a book ahead of time and how you're going to narrate certain things leave certain things out or people's last names stuff like this prosody and, and your, your pace and it, you know you're really you can't be different from chapter two to chapter eight like you can't have significantly different ways that you approach those so how do you get consistency? And then the other fact of like having your audio engineer immediately stop you when you got done with something and say, go back and do it again. At first it's, it seems like a little condescending. It's a little bit over, it was hard for me to, but that's exactly what the audio engineer needs to do because you know, they need to be getting the best capture of what you're saying. So it was really weird. Um, but also it's like, I feel like I'm growing. Like, I feel like I'm learning through this process, uh, I know that I'm learning and this is all good. Um, so I don't know. Um, New York Outcast Doc is walking around scoping out the neighborhood again for research. Yeah. <laughs> so the neighbor, yeah, the neighborhood. So in summer, when I walk, when it's hot, like those are sometimes I have to like stop and grab something to, to drink. Like it gets so like, but I, I love, um, I love being out in the sun. Um, yeah, I've got a, a pretty, uh, uh, it's just, from where I'm at, I have a couple routes that I can, can walk, which are nice, except in winter, you know, it sucks because I live in the second oldest community in my state. So there are no sidewalks, there are very few. So you're like out on the roads or trails and if those ice up and stuff, it gets bad. So um, Vanessa is saying you were learning how to record a book. Yeah. And there is this whole process of learning how to record an audiobook. And like I said, I don't do it here. I do it in a studio. So it's all the professional equipment, a sound booth and stuff and, and, and things like that. So, um, and then the, the engineer is edit, editing everything, you know, putting all of it together. But uh, there's much to learn with that. It's just not simply you open it up and you, you read it, right? I mean, are you going to you know, what do you do for abbreviations? What do you do for citations? Um, you know, and then if you change too much, you no longer have a, a it becomes an unabbreviated, you know, where it's, uh, you know, change from the, the original. Or what do you do when you get to figures in a book? Like, how do you narrate those? Um, and and it, I mean, all those, I guess, are mechanical. The thing for me was like pace. How do you pace yourself? So if you're recording Wednesdays and Fridays that each of those days aren't significantly different. So if someone's listening, it's like, oh, this is a great day for Doc, or here's a day where Doc seems really like tired or something. So that's where my engineer will will stop and he'll say, Hey, listen, let's listen to five minutes of like last recording. Like here's where you need to match. You need to come in at this energy. So which is great. Um I like hiking New York outcasts, hiking trails. I, I I'm with you. Like when I, where I hike and also where I bike, like no one else goes. <laughs> so I tell people where I go. I tell my family where I go. I'm like, if I don't come back, like here's the, here's the trail I was on or the, here's the route I'm going to bike today. But like, if I bike, I might not see anybody else for an hour. So, um, yeah, it is really rural stuff that I'm doing, but I prefer that. Uh, speaking in public, etc., uh, is a very good skill to learn. Military taught me auditorium so speaking. Yeah, it is right. It, it, you know, that's one I've never had a fear of public speaking. And when I presented twice on PBS, the only thing that ir irritated me one time on PBS was I had a an external link that I thought we should have internalized. Like basically, I would have just brought it up from the screen in front of me versus like going out during a live show. And it did have a hiccup going out. So it had a, you know, and I used the doc personality and cover for that until they were able to like fix it in the booth and stuff like that. But, um, but no, I don't, 
I, I, I thrive off of that. Like I, when I present in big audiences or PBS or something like that, those are awesome presentations. That's why people will email and say, hey, it's a really credible, um, yeah, and then I, you know you stay afterwards, and people are in the audience asking questions, and things. But you know, I do less of that now. I was in, I was invited to present at a, a large conference, and it's, it was a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. And I just said, uh, I'm not really into that anymore. You know, um, I just I'm I'm not. You know, I'll do interviews. I'll do key, I'll do keynotes if they're smaller for like a business or a school district or something. That's but I, I'm just. I'm not, and not that I fear it. I don't at all. I just, I don't like the travel. Um, and I, I just don't want to kind of do the prep for it anymore. And just the whole, the whole conference scene, I don't know. For me, I kind of grew out of it. Um, and, uh, you know, the conference stuff is so weird anyway with the pandemic. I, I, I don't know. Spambot Fodder is saying, uh, a good sound engineer. Yeah, my sound engineer is awesome. <laughs> And he's my age, so it's weird being when you're presenting, you're narrating, being stopped and told repeat this again because, like you know, just I, I, people don't typically do that in my normal interactions in life. But he has to do that, right? Because he has he's he needs to get the clear take, and I I'm so glad he does that. Um, but yeah, so Vanessa's saying, um. My commanders found out the presentation classes, the presentation classes were rated so highly by the attendees they decided to have me. That's cool, Vanessa. You bet. I love listening to um, great presenters, right? And everybody does. And, and and people want a presenter to succeed. So I mean, if you're passionate and organized and can relate to people as a presenter, so you know, again, like you know, I. And maybe this is something where I'm just, I, I will revisit it sometime and return to presenting. I did some big presentations in the last couple of years, not only PBS, but, you know, other big keynotes and things. And um, I don't know. Um, it was, <laughs> you were saying, uh, uh, Dr. Terrell, the group is uh, sweating him. Yeah, I am. Uh, I don't like the travel. So, like, this is probably where Aaron, Clary, and I, you know, Aaron, and Aaron's a friend of mine. We're both from Wisconsin, you know, and. I see Aaron quite a few times you know, throughout a year, but um, I don't really care for the travel anymore um, to go somewhere. And I don't care for the, the conferences are all the same. There's no difference. If you've done one, if you present at one conference, they're all the same, you know, and yes, you get treated well, but I mean, then there's so much downtime and conference meals, right. And the, I don't know. Um, and, and I just, I don't know. It's, it's just I, it's just kind of not my gig anymore. It's kind of like back in the 90s. I went to every Green Bay Packers home game in the 90s, every single one, including playoffs. It was cool back then. You know, Brett Favre and Reggie White and things were, you know, a crescendo for the team, you know. And, and now I haven't, I haven't gone to a game in like 15 years. I took my brother-in-law to a game. Um, but I, like, I just don't have any interest. Like, and people always ask me, because they you know, tickets stuff like, hey, do you want to like go to? It? I'm like, not really. Like, I just don't. I just don't want to. <laughs> I just it's not my thing anymore. You know, I don't want to sit out in the cold, and I just don't want to wait in line, and I just don't want to drive there and drive back. And I've experienced that's good enough for me. Like, I'm fine. So, I'm good. Um. So, Jim is saying tra travel does. Yeah, it's just not appealing to me anymore. I, there is a, it just isn't, I just don't want to, to, to do that. Um, Vanessa is saying people were asking me what the heck I did during that course. I told them they had to come up, uh, to learn. So yeah, absolutely. Bacon saying doc, uh, we know doc was in the traveling gigs for the free, <laughs> yeah, the free continental breakfasts. Yeah, no kidding. You know, it wasn't it wasn't bad um, before the pandemic. Um, you know, as you get older, like to be away from home and stuff gets to be more tedious and travel and stuff. I don't I don't really care for that as much. But um, but then that just changed it. You know, like I don't want to. I don't. I'm not delivering a keynote where I have to wear a mask. 
um, that cha it changes the, the whole dynamics of everything. Or, you know, I just, I, I, no, just forget it. I'm not just, it's not something I'm interested in. Um, New York Outcast, it's nice when events happen in a place you actually want to go for some reason. Two birds. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> You're right. There are places where I'm like, I want to go there. So like I will present. That was a big part of, of my, when I would go and keynote and stuff like that, especially in Wisconsin, if it's like somewhere warm, you bet. Um, no kidding. Travel is a professional homeless person. Do that in the Marines. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're always, you're packing and you're up and down the dial, like, you know, WKRP in Cincinnati. You get in that perpetual, yeah, pack and unpack mode. And I don't know, you know, and it's the same conversations with people too. I mean, they're glad to have you there, right? And things like this, but you're having the same initial conversation. So if you hang out with people at night, it's this, usually you're listening to them, which is okay. Um, but I, I don't know. I just don't. It appealed to me much more in my 30s and 40s than it does now. It just doesn't. Uh, so you'd have to really have a pretty powerful pry bar to get me to present anywhere these days. So, you know, <laughs> it just isn't going to happen. Heavy water travel does suck. If you could simply walk into a plane and light a smoke. Yeah. Now you have to wait for an x-ray search, get tested for disease. Yeah. No kidding. Um, yeah, just, uh, so just not into the logistics of things. I used to have it set up, you know, where if you present somewhere, they had to pick you up at the airport, you know, all of that stuff was done, right? You know, they have accommodations would be already set up for you and paid and things like that, but still like, it just takes this chunk of time out of your life. And, um, I don't know. I never thought it was worth it. I don't know. It was worth it at some point, like when I was building up my credentials and experience, stuff like that, but I, it's not, it's just not worth it now. Um, I don't know. But with that said, if somebody wanted to fly me out to Hawaii to do a keynote, pay my expenses and stuff, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. So, um, New York, okay. So I normally have a great time when I travel for pleasure. Everyone is so nicer when you leave New York. I imagine. Um, yeah, no kidding. 1970s. Yeah. Looking back cheapers, you know, we went to, uh, we went to Disney. I drove the family down to Disney in 2017. It's kind of a national lampoons vacation. And, um, so from Wisconsin in winter. And so we left snow to, you know, 85 degrees Orlando and, 2017 was the perfect time to go. I mean, who would have known, like forensically looking back, but I mean, no pandemic, gas was cheap, people were nice, country wasn't, you know, super stressed over war or inflation or things like that. And uh, we just had a, a, every day we were down there was 85 and sunny. And driving had, had uh, uh, some benefits too, because we got to stop in some places that, I wanted to, to kind of experience and getting to see some different parts of the country. And I had a really cool vehicle at the time too, that I drove down there. So it all did kind of mix in, uh, in a good way. But like today, would I drive it? No. Um, or even like flying is kind of weird today. Like I don't, I, I even like the Disney thing is like, I'm, I, the whole appeal of Disney with everything going on, and I've had friends who have gone to Disney and they've said, yeah, it's just not the same. It's far from the same, you know, um, having, uh, you know, very prescribed times for lines and, and fewer things open and the spontaneous, you know, the parade, the big parade stuff has been scaled back. And I said, it just isn't, it hasn't bounced back. It's a different feel to it. So I don't know. I'm glad I did it when I did. We went out to South Dakota in the summer of 2018, drove out there, and that was also perfect timing to get the family out there. So, um, yeah, this is, I hate being a pastor. I, so do I. 
that was one thing too. Like I, I got to the point toward the end when I was doing keynotes and stuff or consulting and be like, I only fly business or first class. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, but I, if you're going to do this, that's my condition. I will only do this. Um, so yeah. Um, bacon. You can't pull over and grab a three quarter pound bacon cheeseburger from Wendy's on an airplane. Oh God. And we, we ate at some great places on our way down and back from Orlando. There was a place in Paducah, Kentucky, um, had, had great, like a family restaurant. Had been there for like, you know, 80 years or something. And all the locals, like we pulled up and like the, the fire department had one of the fire trucks there and they were in there eating. Like, as you can tell, like, uh, this place was great. And it was, and the food was so reasonable. I think like the whole meal for my family, family of four was like $25. I mean, it, it was crazy. Like it was like, I was like, are you sure you're charging me enough for this? I don't understand. And, you know, it's kind of that, that moment in time. So spam bot saying, Hey, we drove from Calgary to Orlando, man. Good for you. 54 in a van. That sucks though. Uh, I'll tell you though. I, I'm glad that I did that. I'm so glad that I did that. Um, yeah. So, all right. Well, as we, uh, as we wrap up here, um, Buy this book. Vanessa will tell you why. And uh, if you're not going to buy it, you can log on to your email or get into your email, find your local library and say, hey, I live here. Please put this book in your library for these reasons. It's awesome. Vanessa said so. Libraries will do that. If you email and say, I live here and this book should be in here to inform parents and taxpayers about how schools are spending money. I would read it, right? I'd come in and read it, get this book. Because what they do is they look it up then on their system and they're like, okay, it's a, it's published. It's out in hundreds of libraries. They'll buy it. They usually won't like try to negotiate you down or anything. Here's a box of crackers. Will that take care of it? You know, don't it. But um, no, that, that works. And uh, so, you know, contact, especially if you have library cards, even more so, but say, you just take it, take three minutes for doc, find your local library, their email thing and say, Hey, like I am a resident here. Uh, we should have this in our library. You can usually search. Maybe your library has it. <laughs> I had somebody who, who said they did that and their library responded and said, we have the book. And they're like, Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't know that. But, um, yeah. So that, that was kind of cool. And yeah, velocity of information. This book is, um, uh, there's again, there's nothing like it. I mean, I, this is, it comes out officially April 1st, but I, I have high aspirations for this book. I, I think this is going to be in the running for awards and recognition. Um, it's punchy. Like no one is going there. It's not a book about a reset or it's not, you know, where you're going to go in a very, um, um, cognitive, um, engaging lane throughout this book. Uh, it's not going to go politically one way or another conspiracy theory. It's not going to go down those routes. So when you, when you're done with this, like it's, I think you're just gonna be like, wow, because I still get that feeling when I read it. Like, I just think it's a wow book and the people I interviewed who are typically people that don't give interviews, but this helped me inform this book. Uh, I'm just really happy with it. And, as Vanessa said, the book could not launch into a better environment for it. Even though there's inflation and all of this stuff going on, the book matches exactly what is happening right now. And that is priceless. Um, and yeah, it, I mean, it's a book where you will go back and you'll read it uh, six months later and it, it will resonate a little differently with you. You'll pick some things out and it will always be relevant. So Bacon said, man, my local library moonlights as a temporary homeless encampment. I don't know anyone going there is going to rent it. Maybe you've lost the information. Yeah, libraries have kind of changed, right? Um, but yeah, um, but li libraries, if you go to most library 
homepage is they will ask their patrons to request books. And if their patrons request it, they typically have the funds will go for it. I have been quitting your school of errors ever since I finished it. Quitting. All right. So it is a certain, I think I'm misinterpreting that, Vanessa, but I know you, you enjoy the book. Um, so yes, um, it is really philosophy of information, quoting, here we go. <laughs> That's what I thought. I'm like, oh no, Vanessa's given up on the book. Yeah, quoting. I I quote the Taurus out of there a ton. Um, and from velocity of information, I'm, you know, I quote out of there, like, you know, extracting intelligence from information and things like this. And I'll tell you, like, when you start saying things like I'm informing my decisions based upon what member checks other people are telling me, people are like, holy smokes, what are you, that's amazing what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, it's, it's good stuff. So, all right. What I, what I think I'm going to do next Monday night is I'm, I think that show is going to be the difference between crisis and chaos, because that's a chapter in my book, um, philosophy of information, the difference between crisis and chaos and people will intermingle those, you know, they're same, same thing, but they're not, uh, they are substantially different. And I will tell you exactly how to identify if something is a crisis or something is a chaos is a chaos event. And I, that's going to be very helpful for especially what is kind of happening right now. But as a recap for today, and thank you, Vanessa, for having that book front and center. I have it on my left-hand side and I picked out, this is from the my first box of books. So this is my, my, uh, my working copy of philosophy of information that I start to mark up and stuff. Um, of course, school of errors, but, um, yeah, it is, it is, uh, so, so today we talked about comorbid chaos events. So think of chaos that goes on for 90 days, great depression. Um, the dust storms, you know, the 1930s, the pandemic, inflation, um, civil unrest, and now international conflict. So you have these types of things, and those are, when they happen comorbid, two of those things happening at once. Um, that's very, very rare, actually, in history to have those happen for 90 days and keep going. And when those happen, people usually do crowd in behavior, which I wrote about, and kind of shut down entrepreneurial spirit, like you're not seeing new businesses start up or at least as many as you thought. People aren't going to school to get advanced degrees. They're not kind of changing jobs, these types of, not taking vacations, whatever it could be, um, because they don't think things are getting better, especially now when you enter the second wave of a chaos event. So people are going to cut back. They're spending a ton, and we're going to see this kind of ripple through. You know, when, you, when people feel that it's no longer transitory, they'll start to, you know, start their own business or take on, uh, you know, do vacations or do some of these things again, but we're not there. And, uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're pretty far from that right now. So people are just really cocooning in. And it's one of these things if it, if it continues to happen for another year or two is it's really going to hammer the economy and just kind of the psyche of people. It's going to wear people down. Um, cause again, what would be your motivation to be a new small business owner when you could be deemed essential or non-essential at any moment? Or if your, you know, uh, business could be hammered by inflation or suddenly now your, your cost to, you know, ship things has gone up fourfold or something like that. I mean, people aren't going to deal with that. Um, so we don't have any stability. I, th I think it's going to happen. I think stability will come back maybe after midterm elections or maybe I think 2024 would be like the, the point. And if it, if it wouldn't happen, then, then ouch, then I think we're in trouble, but all right. Well, everybody, I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate all of you. Um, uh, Vanessa, uh, bacon, uh, Jim, heavy water, uh, spam bot fodder, uh, New York outcast. So thank you so much. So yeah, I'm going to, uh, exit here and uh fire up the uh fireplace bring up some wood 
and I will do our exit the same as our intro right here. So I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Uh, whoa, here we go. Have a uh, terrific night, and I'm going to exit us out the same way that I brought us in. All right, take care, everybody. Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perotin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.